£12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 12 o'clock on Friday the 22nd of March. England, Eurasia. Politicians across all parties have now united to decry the outrageous decision to alter the England flag on official football shirts. Out with the red and white, in with the blues and purples. Playful update or woke nonsense? Hello, hello, hello. Coppers have come calling on the Tory donor who said Diane Abbott made you want to hate all black women, despite his apology. Is raking over years-old comments a good use of police time? No white men allowed. Alleged comments surfaced from ITV Commissioner Nicola Lloyd saying we really don't want any more white men when discussing primetime news anchors. An official complaint says this discrimination breaches the Equality Act. I was very surprised when I heard that the police had decided to investigate this Tory donor. This Tory donor who's apologised, whose comments have been widely publicised, uh, alleged comments, I should say. What is there to investigate? I can't... Uh, it baffles me. Do you know what annoys me about this, besides the fact that I don't think you should criminalise speech, mm. really? Um, is that the police are failing across the board to tackle what I would call real crimes, whether it's sexual assault, whether it's burglaries, whether it's muggings, whether it's whatever it is, yeah. they are failing on a grand scale. Something like 90% of crimes that are reported go unsolved. So the police 
you know, if you can't fight the real crime, what do you do? Mm. You fight the non-crime. Right. This guy is clearly not a threat. He's, he's, he used foul language, language that I don't think any reasonable or civilised person should use. But does anyone actually think that he's going to go and kill Diana? But it's West Yorkshire Police, I would imagine, have a lot more important things mm. to be focused on, but let us know what you think. GBV's at gbnews.com. Should the police be investigating speech? However horrible it was, however it's been perceived as racist, mm. um, the alleged remarks, should the police be spending time on this? It's your headlines. <laughs> Tom, Emily, thanks very much. 12.02, the headlines from the GB newsroom this afternoon. And the latest developments in the top story. Rishi Sunak has now criticised Nike's alteration of the St George's Cross on its New England football kit after changing the colours to blue and purple. The company says the redesign was a playful update ahead of the Euro 2024 tournament in June. However, speaking earlier, the Prime Minister said the traditional red and white colours are a mark of public pride and it shouldn't be messed with. Obviously, I prefer the original, and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. Well, that follows similar comments from the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, who said the multicoloured design is pointless and unnecessary. And the Labour leader, Sakia Starmer, has also urged the sports brand Nike to revert to the original flag's colours. Well, we've been speaking to people outside Nike's store in central London to get their thoughts. England is England. You know, you, you start changing its colours, you start changing the flags. Yeah, it, it represents something that's traditional and perhaps it should stay that way. Yes, I like it. I cannot say more, but I think it looks, looks great. I think it could have been better. Like, I think the old shirts, like retro, I think they could have made them more like them because I think they're quite good shirts. Like they're the best. In other news, Sir Geoffrey Cox says that Labour's projected landslide at the next general election could, he says, annihilate a credible opposition. The former Attorney General is warning that a possible win for Sakia Starmer would leave the Conservatives without a front bench and called it a very dangerous thing for democracy. In a GB News exclusive, the MP said Rishi Sunak is a serious administrator, but suggested the Prime Minister needs to reveal more of himself to sway voters. 100 seat majority, 80 seat majority is big, but the proposal at the moment, the suggestion that, that Labour might win a 200 seat majority effectively annihilates any credible opposition. That's bad for democracy. Mm. But on our part, we need to show why. The Home Secretary has today vowed to crack down on spiking by updating the law to hold perpetrators to account. Legislation in England and in Wales is being changed to make it clear that it's a crime. The most recent figures show more than 560 spiking offences are reported every month involving food, drink, needles and modified vapes. Campaigners, though, say the true number of victims could be even higher. We know that with the drugs that are prevalent in spiking, that uh, speed is of the essence. And of course, what we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls. And the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. We've heard today that a man who's been described as a loner has been jailed for life with a minimum of 37 years for the murder of a couple he was working for by poisoning them with the opioid fentanyl. Luke DeWitt pretended to be a doctor and a member of a fake support group before rewriting the wills of Stephen and Carol Baxter in their 60s to benefit for himself. A jury found the 34-year-old from Essex was guilty on Wednesday of this week and he was sentenced at Chelmsford Crown Court earlier today. The latest government figures show more than 800 people have illegally crossed the English Channel in small boats in the past week. 263 reached UK waters on Thursday alone as criminal gangs took advantage of a brief weather improvement.
That surge has prompted the government to declare a migrant emergency in the Channel, and it takes the total number of crossings for the year so far to just over 4,300. That's 600 more than the same time last year. Meanwhile, delays are expected in the approval of the Rwanda bill affecting planned flights. And uh, the latest on the alleged racist comments made by Frank Hester in 2019, we now know that uh, the police in northwest Yorkshire are investigating those alleged comments. The Metropolitan Police transferred the case because of his comments that were reported to have been made in Leeds during a meeting. Officers there say they are now looking at whether a crime was committed. The businessman, who's already given the party £10 million, is accused of saying the MP Diane Abbott had made him want to hate all black women. The funeral of 15-year-old Mason Rist is being held in Bristol later. He was stabbed to death there in January alongside his best friend Max Dixon, who was also laid to rest yesterday. A total of 12 people were arrested in connection with their deaths and five people have been charged with murder. The partner of Max's mother is taking part in a charity walk between Western Supermare's Grand Pier and Bristol to raise funds in their memory. And finally, funding has been announced for nearly 1,000 new electric buses in England. 25 councils are to get a share of £143 million with rural areas prioritised. The Department for Transport claims the vehicles that will be fitted with Wi-Fi and USB charging points will be zero emission to help improve air quality. Those are the latest headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code there on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com slash alerts. But now it's back to Tom and Emily. It's 12.08. You're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, the Conservatives, Labour and Liberal Democrats have all united in criticising the decision to give the St George's Cross a playful colour update on the New England football shirt ready for the Euros this summer. Well, Sir Keir Starmer told The Sun newspaper that he thinks they should just reconsider and change it back as Nigel Farage and Lee Anderson have also criticised the decision. Previously, sir, shirts have regularly featured the red and white St George's flag. And now there's this rather bizarre multicoloured one. Mm. Now, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, also weighed in on the controversy a little earlier. Let's take a listen. Obviously, I prefer the original, and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. Perfect just the way they are. That's so sweet. You're perfect just the way you are. Oh, it's a line from Bridget Jones' diary. It is, if I'm not mistaken. yes. <laughs> it is. It's a very romantic part yeah. of the film. But of course, all the politicians want to have their say on this mm. one. They think, good, I can show my national pride. Yeah. I can show I'm the man of the people. I can show I'm patriotic. Um, do you believe at home they actually care? Mm, interesting questions. But we've sent our reporter, Theo Chicomba, to uh, Nike Town in central London. Theo, uh, what's the feeling on the ground? Yeah, well, often football fans will use today to kind of see who's going to be in the team and who's going to be playing tomorrow. Big game tomorrow, England versus Brazil. But the attention today is all on the shirt, uh, the new colours on the St George's flag. Uh, many people saying, why has it changed? And others saying, well, actually, I quite like the new design. It represents the society that we live in at the moment. But here at Nike Town, which is the flagship store for Nike, here in central London, they have begun selling the shirts uh, this morning ahead of that big game tomorrow. But the mood here, we've been getting the mood, speaking to people, uh, finding out whether or not they do like this new design. And this is what they had to say. England is England, you know, you, you start changing its colours, you start changing the flags, yeah, it, it represents something that's traditional and perhaps it should stay that way. Being Welsh, I'm not really bothered, <laughs> to be honest, but England's England, so it should be the original St George's Cross. I think it could have been better, like, I think the old shirts, like retro, I think they could have made them more like them, because I think they're quite good shirts, like, they're the best. Why change it? Why change it? It's a part of England, isn't it? So I don't know quite why they're changing it all of a sudden. 
Well, it's not often we hear politicians from all sides coming together, but certainly this has unified everyone saying, actually, the original design should be kept as it is. It's a sense of national pride and the Prime Minister warning, you know, it shouldn't be changed and he prefers the old design. But certainly ahead of the day tomorrow with that big game, this is definitely the talking point of the town today. Thank you very much indeed, Theo Jacomba, and for bringing us the uh, voices of the public mm. there out and about on Oxford Street. Good stuff. Yeah, no, really, really interesting. It's got seemingly the whole country talking this morning. But sports commentator Aidan McGee joins us now. And Aidan, uh, how usual is it? It seems like there are lots and lots of New England shirts. Is there, is there a new one every year? Uh, this seems to have been the most controversial for quite a while. Yeah, it's certainly the most controversial, Tom. Good morning to you both, first of all. Uh, what I would say is that the, the deal used to be about every four years when I was a kid. Then it went to about every two years. It's roughly that now. I don't see anything inherently political about the symbol. I just don't think that supporters, particularly England fans, they tend to be quite a patriotic lot. They don't like the idea of somebody else, like like a commercial entity like such as Nike, taking the, a national symbol and making it into something that, that they feel it should represent. I think that's what annoys people, quite apart from any kind of cost implications. I mean, the stadium yeah. stadium level shirt is going to be costing about £125. This is a football shirt we're talking about. Oh. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not a car. So I don't think necessarily this is about, this is about politics. So yes, people can read things into it. It's just a change of colour. We saw it in the in London 2012, the Olympics. The the Union flag was turned into a but kind I guess of the issue navy the blue, uh, sky blue shirt. So you don't think there's anything political about it? Because lots of people are saying this is about wokery. This is woke nonsense that they're doing this. You wouldn't do well, this with any other flag. Why the England flag? Why the St George's Cross? Well, I think I think it's true that, that it's perfectly true to say that you probably wouldn't do it with other flags, and it does bear a passing resemblance to some other symbols we've seen, which are inherently political. And, of course, the FA has had no problem meddling in politics over the last five or six years, and I think that's probably at the behest of some of their sponsors. If you look at their, their website, they've got some very uh, they've got some very, very interesting deals with companies who've been involved in not or not afraid to meddle in politics over the last few years. But, no, I don't think... The FA certainly haven't said it's political. The manufacturers haven't said it's political. I don't think there's going to be a huge pushback from... Well, I think there'll be a huge pushback from Nike themselves because there's a huge production cost that goes into producing these shirts. They sell around about 1.8 million of these per year. Wow. So, we get as well, the FA paid £400 million over 12 years for this kit deal. So, they're going to have some kind of say over over the the, the, the license or the design of, of the of the emblems and the crest. But we, have to, we do have some precedent, precedent at club level. Clark, Cardiff City, for example tried to launch a red shirt. They wore a red, red kit for a season. The fans were up in arms about it. They didn't buy it. I don't understand why these organisations would mm. try and annoy their customers. It really doesn't make any sense. And the final point for me on this would be the football regulator has been brought in to try and safeguard clubs against owners coming in and meddling with issues of heritage. This, which is the FA, the FA is doing, the FA signed off on this, they're to blame. This falls exactly into that category and probably shows why the FA is not fit for purpose. Interesting. Wow. The FA are to blame. Um, well, well they're, de they're definitely to blame. They're definitely to blame. They, they signed off on this. Nike yep. are a commercial entity. They're, they're about making designs that will sell. So they're going to push the boundaries a little bit. The FA are the ones who said, yeah, that's OK. Our fans will love it. But this isn't a reason to have a regulator, is it? So no, that they don't mess around with shirts? No, I, I mean, is that I, I, really I, I, the I issues they should be looking at? No, it's, it, it's not. It's absolutely not. But this is the point. The FA are meant to be the regulator of football, and they're already failing on one of the tests that the, that the football mm -hmm. regulator or the government's white paper identified, so they brought this problem on themselves. I suppose, Aidan, there's only so many ways you can make a shirt look different, and if you're bringing out a new one every two years, you're going to get to yes. the point where they start changing the flag or changing other fundamental elements yeah. of well, it, because they're trying the, to sell the, the, these the, things. The other point of issue, Tom, is that sometimes manufacturers have been known to just tinker with small areas of design in order to gain to gain a bit of traction online or in order to make a kit a talking point. It's not a big deal at club level now when clubs change their kit because it happens every year. When I was a kid, I mean, there were some areas of the country, like Newcastle United, for example, back in the 80s, they refused to change their yeah. kit any, any more often than three years because of the high unemployment area. Or it, or sorry, the high unemployment in the area, which meant that kids couldn't afford the shirts. We should also say as well that most of these shirts are, are sold to adults who you would think. So that, that kind of limits the argument about, you know, 
kids complaining because they can't their parents can't afford the shirts. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if I bought an England shirt, I'd expect it to be white and red. But there you go. Thank and you I'd very much. I'd expect it to cost less than 100 quid. Yeah, they are that much. It's yes. crazy. Thank 100, you very 125, much. 125. 125. 125. 125. Oh, goodness well, me. there you go. You can start saving up. But thank you very much, Aidan McGee, yeah. of course. But, but 100, 125 quid, what did Aidan say? Over a million of these are sold? This is a lot of money. You it's know, a huge industry. It's quite funny because the, the flag, what they've done to the flag actually looks like the bisexual flag. Actually, it's the colours of colours of that. Now, I don't think that's what they were trying to do here. Blue but it's and just, purple. It's is quite it? funny. Blue, purple, and pink. It looks, mm. you know, a little bit. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I'm not saying any conspiracy. I'm not saying that's what they were trying to do but with they it. They're turning. But it England's... is those colours. So well, I mean, go. that's one way to stick it to Saudi Arabia, isn't well, it? Oh yes. <laughs> if there's another, I don't know where. I don't know where the Euros are this year, but um. But, I mean, if there were another World Cup to be hosted in a country like Saudi Arabia, perhaps they should make it a rainbow colour. Well, there you go. <laughs> Shall we read a statement from... From Nike. From Nike. It's Nike. 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 Nike, Nike. Th this is a bigger anyway, scandal. This is a bigger anyway, scandal than the colours. what do they have to say? The England 2024 home kit disrupts history with a modern take on a classic. The trim on the cuffs takes its cues from the training gear worn by England's 1966 heroes, with a gradient of blues and reds topped with purple. The same colours also feature an interpretation of the flag, an interpretation of the flag <laughs> of St George on the back of the collar. It's just a bit of modern art, Tom. Ooh. Nothing to worry about, just a bit of modern art. I still think the biggest scandal here is how everyone's pronouncing Nike, but Nike. what do I know? <laughs> Nike. Uh, coming up, as police launch an investigation into a Tory donor's alleged race comments, we're asking, is raking over years old comments a good use of police time? That to come, this is Good Afternoon Britain on GB News. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictively went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a crew that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the king was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, throughout all these families, I see it on a day-to-day on -day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the, the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Mm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word, so inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussexes' stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the king is ill, Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father, as far as we know. And Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 21 minutes past 12, and the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has refused to comment on a police investigation into the alleged racist comments made by Tory party donor Frank Hester. Yes, this all comes as Mr Hester's alleged racist comments from 2019 are now being investigated by West Yorkshire Police. Well, a spokesperson for the force said that officers were now working to establish the facts and ultimately ascertain whether a crime has been committed. So they haven't yet decided whether there's been a crime, but they are beginning an investigation. So GB News political correspondent Olivia Utley joins us now. Uh, Olivia, were we expecting the police to get involved? Do we know who reported the comments to the police? Did Diane Abbott report them or is it someone else? It's not clear who reported the comments to the police. All we know is that it was first uh, reported to the Metropolitan Police and the Metropolitan Police passed it on to West Yorkshire Police who are opening an investigation. West Yorkshire Police say that the incident uh, has only just been... Uh, they've only just been alerted to the incident and we can expect the investigation to go on for, for quite a while. It puts Rishi Sunak in a pretty difficult spot. He was criticised when this scandal first broke a couple of weeks ago for refusing at first to call out Mr Hester's comments as racist. It was only when Kemi Badenoch said uh, on air that these comments were racist that other ministers ended up falling in behind her. But Rishi Sunak was accused of weak leadership for only acting once another minister acts. It's not exactly sort of leading from the front. He had hoped that now the, the conversation had sort of gone away again. Frank Hester donated £10 million to the Conservative Party and there was some talk of uh, the Conservative Party having to hand that back. So far, Rishi Sunak has managed to avoid that fate, but now the matter has been referred to the police, it will trundle on possibly for months and will certainly be fuel to Labour's fire when criticising Sunak. It's slightly baffling to me why this is a police investigation. Frank Hester has apologised for the comments. Um, the comments were widely reported. I mean, might an element of this, I suppose, be finding out precisely what the comments were? Because we haven't heard any recording of these. We've only got the Guardian report to go on. Well, I think that's I think that's a really important point. We haven't yet heard a recording of this, and I think if, if West Yorkshire were to determine that a crime had been committed, they would have to hear some mm. sort of recording. I think there will be viewers possibly watching this who think that maybe this isn't the best use of uh, the resources of West Yorkshire Police. It's not quite clear exactly what the crime would be, possibly uh, a hate crime. But the problem is that because this probably isn't the top of the to-do list for West Yorkshire Police, there are obviously more urgent crimes that they are investigating, it means that it will probably go on for quite a long time. And the longer this is a live investigation, the more difficult it becomes for Rishi Sunak, not just because of it is, of course, problematic having one of your donors be uh, called uh, a racist, but also because it means that it makes it very difficult for the Prime Minister to bury a scandal which painted him personally in quite a bad light. The very fact that he didn't act and then did act purely because uh, Kemi Badenoch spoke first doesn't speak particularly well of him. Mm. And that there is often a, com a, a complaint, both within the Conservative Party and outside it, that Rishi Sunak sort of isn't particularly good at politics. He's a bit uh, wet behind the ears. He was only uh, elected as an MP uh, very recently. And all of this just adds to that mm. impression. So the longer this goes on, the, the harder it is for Rishi Sunak to sort of bury that, that, that idea. Yeah, just as they seem to be of putting it behind them in terms of where the political conversation had gone, it's now reared its ugly head again. Well, Olivia Utley, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I suppose it's a crucial, crucial question for West Yorkshire Constabulary. I'm sure they'll spend lots of time, lots of resources on determining was this a hate crime or a non-crime hate incident? Uh, really good use of everyone's time there. 
Yes, well, I want to know whether there could be a crime here and whether it's a good use of police time. So let's discuss this with the former police officer and former head of the National Counterterrorism Security Office, Chris Phillips. Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Now, some are saying that perhaps under the law, what Frank Hester, the Tory donor, allegedly said could be construed as uh, incitement to violence against black women. Um, legally speaking, what could the police do here? Well, uh, in my opinion, the police are quite right to open the investigation uh, and then should close it almost immediately because it's uh, clearly uh, a nonsense. The, 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 the police here have to be seen to be doing the right thing and, of course, they'll be criticised whatever decision they make uh, and just... Um, what it actually needs is someone at a reasonably senior level in the police to say, listen, we've got far more serious crimes than this to deal with. It's not unlikely even to be a crime. If it was a crime, it's five years old. Under any other circumstances, we wouldn't investigate this uh, and make a, a, a decision and then stand by it. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm afraid what we don't have these days so much is, is strong leadership in the police to, to do that. Do you think that this is just a, a matter of media pressure? And, and had these comments been made by someone who wasn't in the public eye, this perhaps wouldn't have been an investigation? It, it's completely that. Yes, it is media pressure. And we do have to look at the media and say, well, listen, who's running the show here? You know, the, 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 the police uh, have to do a very difficult job. West Yorkshire has got the highest crime rate, I think, in the country, certainly one of them. Uh, and they've got plenty to do without these kind of things being stirred up. And of all the people, Diane Abbott is, you know, you could investigate some of the things she said live on TV over the years if you really wanted to go down this route. Uh, you know, even even things that she said more recently, you know, you'd say, mm. well, you know, they're, they're, they could be a problem if you're going to treat mm. this as a crime as well. I, I mean, Chris, the police are often accused of not following up on basic crimes and also very serious crimes like sexual assault and burglaries, armed burglaries and, and the like. I mean, I saw a stat recently that 90% of crimes are going unsolved, which is terrible. So is this a case of the police... You know, they can't go, they can't solve real crime, so they're going after non crimes. Or what's going on here? Well, I, listen, I, it's easy to blame the police on this. You know, the, the investigation, you know, probably had to be open. There's political need for it to be open, but it does need someone to say, look, you know, we've got our hands full with everything that we're doing on, on, on crime, and this is just not important enough to deal with. Uh, the, you know, the police have been decimated. Over the last 15 years, policing has been decimated. Lack of... Uh, uh, a lack of resources, police stations being closed, uh, young police officers who are staying two or three years and thinking they've had enough. The police have got so many problems on their hands to deal with. What they don't need is the media and the... Uh, and and politicians effectively stirring up these kind of things. Because let's be quite frank, if we're going to be offended by everything that comes out on the television or otherwise, mm. then, you know, we're just we're just stuck because uh, the police are going to be doing nothing other than that. And, and I know 99% of the public do not want police to be focusing on this kind of nonsense. Mm, my wise words. Well, Chris Phillips, thank you very much for joining us, the former head of the National Counterterrorism Security Office. Uh, really appreciate your thoughts. Yes, let us know what you think about this. The views are coming in. Some of you saying, actually, her comments were racist and they could be seen as inciting violence. Others saying this is absolutely absurd use of police time. So let mm. us know what you think about it. We'll come to your views uh, very shortly. Um, but let's get your headlines. Tom, Emily, thanks very much. Good afternoon. It's exactly 12.30, a recap of the headlines this half hour. Rishi Sunak has now criticised Nike's alteration of the St George's Cross on its new England football kit after changing the colours to blue and purple. The company says the redesign was a playful update ahead of the Euro 2024 tournament in June. However, speaking earlier, the Prime Minister said the traditional red and white colours are a mark of public pride and he said it shouldn't be messed with. Obviously, I prefer the original, and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. Um, 
A man who's been described as a loner has today been jailed for life for the murder of a couple he worked for by poisoning them with the opioid fentanyl. Luke D. Witt invented fake personas and rewrote the wills of Stephen and Carol Baxter, who were in their 60s, to take charge of their company. Speaking in the last hour, the couple's daughter told the court that the 34-year-old killer had completely brainwashed her mother by posing as a fake doctor. He was sentenced today and will serve a minimum of 37 years behind bars. Sir Geoffrey Cox has warned that Labour's projected landslide at the next general election could annihilate a credible opposition. The former Attorney General says a win for Sakia Starmer would leave the Conservatives without a front bench and called it a very dangerous thing for democracy. Speaking to GB News, the MP said that Rishi Sunak is a serious administrator, but he suggested the Prime Minister still needs to reveal more of himself to sway voters. The latest government figures have shown that more than 800 people have illegally crossed the English Channel in small boats in the, in the past week. 263 people reached UK waters on Thursday alone as criminal gangs took advantage of a brief weather improvement. That surge has prompted the government to declare a migrant emergency in the Channel and it takes the total number of crossings for the year so far to 4,300. That's 600 more than the same time last year. And legislation in England and Wales is being updated to crack down on spiking and to make it clear it's a crime. The most recent figures show more than 560 spiking offences are reported every month involving food, drink, needles and modified vapes. Campaigners say the true number, though, of victims could be even higher. However, the Home Secretary says the updated law will hold perpetrators to account. Those are the latest headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2582 and €1.1634. The price of gold is £1,724.29 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,923 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Absenteeism and parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. Mm. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm mm. going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently were, uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Yeah. So how could, you know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months. But if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know taking great measures Well, to I think that. one of Punishing. their plans is to have a national register, hmm. which, 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 would, which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's, it's almost... It's, you can't, well, they can't deal with the real problem, so they're going after it's... actually perfectly you know, decent parents who are just taking the odd day off you know, for, to save money, frankly.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 36 minutes past midday, and you have been getting in touch over your views on this police investigation. Frank Hester is a Conservative Party donor. He's given the party £10 million, and his comments caused a political furore in the last few weeks around Diane Abbott, saying she made him want to hate all black women. But... And also been... that... Uh... Shoot her. Oh, she should be shot, should was be the shot. phrase he used. Now, I don't think many people thought he was talking literally, but now there's a police investigation. Uh, and uh, John has written in to say, once again, this shows the police are treating people from a Tory background differently <laughs> to people from a Labour background. <laughs> um, Margaret says... After five years, it's totally ridiculous to be conducting a probe into this Tory donor now. Haven't the police better things to do? I would argue, yes, they certainly do, Margaret. Um, but uh, Kevin says that he should be prosecuted for his evil racist comments. If you can't see that it's encouraging violence against black women, how do you know? So there you go. Mm, although Neil says... Aren't the police supposed to in investigate crimes, not investigate whether things were crimes? Although, I, I can't say I necessarily agree with you there, Neil, because how do you know something's a crime unless it's been investigated? I just, I just think that it's unlikely that this speech given to a room full of people where the very bad taste things were said in a not at all appropriate way, whether that's actually a crime. Also, we have such, we have such wide reaching hate speech laws now that it's it true. could be a crime. It's true. Or it could be a non crime hate incident. Yes, one which of those. are all logged. Theresa May's speech as Home Secretary one year. I think it was 2014 or 2015, was reported to the police and lodged as a non-crime hate incident. That's how, that's how bonkers we got. Sort of... I, thought, I thought we clamped down on these a bit. I thought the police had been told by the Home Secretary, I'm not sure if it was Suella Braverman... We've had so many Home that Secretaries. ..said actually we're not going to have non-crime hate incidents. You can stop recording those. But this is an interesting point. Mm. Roy says, of course this should be investigated. Two MPs have been murdered in recent years mm. and this man has allegedly said that Abbott should be shot. This is incitement to another headbanger to come along and kill an MP. What do you make of that? I think it's a stupid thing to say that someone should be shot, but it's also obviously a turn of phrase. Uh, surely we've all heard in people say, oh, ugly, they, should, though, be, they should be shot. Like, uh, people mm. don't always mean that in a literal way. Mm. It, it's, it's metaphorical language. It's deeply inappropriate language. It obviously shouldn't be used about an MP. Uh, but it is, a, it is the way that some people do talk well, Paul, in, in Paul says a man metaphorical e ways. Paul says, a man expressed his dislike for Diane Abbott. Where is the crime? If it's a crime to dislike politicians, millions are guilty. It's the way in which he expressed his dislike Racist for Diane comments. Abbott, though. Like, Racist he's, comments. He's, if you, it, it's very... There wouldn't be a scandal if he was just saying, I really don't like Diane Abbott because what she said about, I don't know, the Jewish people. I mean, if you, if you just... If he'd have stuck to the facts and not gone into conjecture, and not gone into racist language, there wouldn't be an issue. Another story that caught my eye today is a story for the NIMBYs out there. Oh, yes. There's outrage because there are plans to build 63,000 new homes in Milton Keynes. But is the outrage justified? Now, Milton Keynes is about, what, uh, 30 miles north of... About an hour away from London. About an hour away north of but, I mean, London. It's, it's purpose-built. Isn't the bonkers thing here that if there was any place in the country 
literally designed for new homes. It is Milton Keynes. Uh, this is a place that was uh, confected as a new place. It's now a city, actually, the city of Milton Keynes, but originally a town that was built after the war as a purpose-built place uh, hang on, to have isn't... new houses so that you could mm. uh, not have overcrowding uh, and, and you could fit more people. But, Tom, you just the... want to build everywhere. You'd be happy to, you know, you'd be happy to concrete over the entirety of the United <laughs> Kingdom. <laughs> not, I've um, heard something so ridiculous. Although, I'm not sure you would like it if you were living in a village, and we're talking about villages here, sort of in and around Milton mm. Keynes, that are going to allegedly go to be swamped uh, by these new homes, these thousands these are... and thousands of new so homes. I'm... If you were living in that village and you quite liked your life how it was, you had, you know, a few shops or not even probably that many shops, maybe one pub, maybe one school, maybe one something. Are we talking about the same Milton Keynes? Because I, I, Milton Keynes has, I, I'm sure, lots of lovely qualities, it's not the most beautiful part of the world. It's very concretey. It's very post-war. It's a car place designed for cars with stretches of concrete car parks everywhere. Actually, if I were to be doing anything in Milton Keynes, it would be making it a bit more walkable, a bit less car yeah, dependent, but it's perhaps by a bit more greenery, dense isn't it? It's in terms surrounded of how by the greenery, and that's where is. I think the villages are, where they don't want all these extra houses. I've looked now, the at problem the is not extra houses. The problem is not only extra houses, I don't think. I imagine it's also the fact that they may not feel they have adequate infrastructure to cope with that demand. Mm. So, do they have the transport needed? Do they have the schools? Do they have the dentists? Do they have the doctor's surgeries? Do they have, you know, everything? And has that been planned before they come and say, oh, we're going to have tens of thousands of new homes plonked but in the vicinity? And also, what will they look like? That's true. Building codes, design codes, very important. But this, is, this is for 2050. This is the number for 2050. That's a very long time away. That's true. And, and it, it should be, surely, should be the most simple thing to say, we're going to build a community rather than just plonk some houses in a field. We're going to build a beautiful community with amenities uh, and, and with infrastructure to go well, along with If anyone with at it. home, I'd be interested to know if anyone at home lives in the picturesque villages, as they're called, of Castlethorpe, Hanslope and Haversham, because that's where there might be a new town sort of built mm. with all these new homes. So if you, if you live in the vicinity, are you happy there's going to be all these new homes? I mean, we do need them. We, uh, we have a housing shortage, so uh, they're going to have to go somewhere. And Milton Keynes is as good a place as any, I surely. Think Milton Keynes is almost a purpose-built place, place for such a thing. <laughs> um, but we're going to be speaking to the MP for Milton Keynes South a little bit later in the show. He's been campaigning against these uh, housing developments, so we'll have to hear what he has to say. We will indeed. But a charity in Lincolnshire has said it needs to raise £80,000 before it can complete a regional landmark, a tribute to a World War II bomber that will be taller than the Angel of the North. But the local council and the government haven't provided any funding. Uh, local people, and indeed people across the country, are crowdfunding instead, which I think is actually nice. perhaps a nicer way to do it. But uh, our East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis, has more. The plane that took the fight to Germany. It's a Lancaster, the mightiest aerial engine of destruction ever conceived and built. Now a charity in Lincolnshire is building a permanent landmark to remember the aircraft's vital role in winning the campaign against Nazi Germany. At Timmins Engineering near Lincoln, the frame is forming. Ken Sadler is chair of the Bomber County Gateway Trust. When you talk about Lincolnshire, it's inextricably linked to, to the RAF and arguably the, Lan the Lancaster defended the freedom that we all enjoy today. Most of the 7,000 Lancasters built were stationed in the county with their crew. Today, Britain's only flying Lancaster is based here too at RAF Coningsby. The Lancaster landmark will weigh around 92 tonnes when it's finished. That's six times heavier than the real one. And when it's in place, it will be taller than the Angel of the North. But building it isn't cheap. Dave Starling's firm Timmins is working for free. Both his grandparents were in the RAF. It's nice to be able to do it and to honour the Lancaster. It's such a, such a statement piece for Lincolnshire. You know, we are Bomber County and we're proud of it. The pace of the million pound project has dropped as the price of materials like steel rises. 
We've actually been gifted the steel for these ribs, uh, which again is about £20,000, um, but we need some cash now to pay for the labour to fabricate them. Soon the Lancaster will be lifted onto a frame at Charlie White's farm on a hillside overlooking the border with Nottinghamshire to be seen by 34,000 drivers every day. They're going to look up and see this landmark on the side of a hill in Lincolnshire and think what an amazing tribute to, to the counties. Although designed as a heritage landmark, the charity understands how meaningful the Lancaster will be to those who remember lives lost. Hopefully this will just remind people of, um, of the sacrifice and, um, and the values that we, that we hold dear and should hold dear. The Trust hopes to complete the structure in 2025. The cost exceeds many thousands of pounds, but a far greater price has already been paid. Yes, they did a grand job, all right. Will Hollis, GB News in Lincolnshire. They are fantastic planes. I, I remember going uh, uh, much younger. Seen one? Uh, yes, yes. There's a wonderful museum, Duxford Air Museum, uh, where I, I grew up quite close to it. And we used to go, and you can you can see the Spitfires, the Hurricanes, uh, and indeed the bombers too. And My the grandfather always... was in the RAF. In the RAF. In the RAF. Is that what he called it? In the Royal Air. Yeah. Is that, is, that because, is that because he had a very uh, cut glass accent, as, as it seemed that all pilots did? They all talked like this, and it was all very, very posh. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, but uh, you, can, you can donate um, by visiting the Bomber County Gateway Trust website or their Just Giving page. So it's www.bombergatewaytrust.co.uk. I don't know if we can get that on screen. Um, mm -hmm. Justgiving.com or justgiving.com. Um, slash campaign slash bomber county. There we go. Gateway. There it is. There's there we go. But it's it's a very yeah. And on the screen down there, very important stuff. And these these sort of memorials really do uplift an area. Um, and it's, it's it would be a, a lovely place. I think it's between. It's just outside Newark. I think it's got, quite dear. Yeah. But I think worth it. No, Why not? it would be a splendid, splendid memorial. But uh, coming up, a complaint is lodged with ITV after a senior commissioner allegedly told a panel audience, we don't want white men anymore. We'll have more on that How very that shortly. How does that feel, Tom? Hi there and welcome to the forecast from the Met Office. It's going to feel cold in the wind for the rest of today in many places. Heavy showers and even some snow on the hills of northern UK. Low pressure now firmly in charge to the north of the country. Tightly packed isobars and our winds coming from the west, northwest, with this rain clearing for the rest of the day from the southeast. Clear spells, yes, but also quite a number of showers coming in on that northwesterly wind. And those showers frequent and heavy across northwestern parts of the country. Not as many showers for the southeast, but for most places it's going to be a blustery night. And with those winds staying relatively brisk, it's going to be largely frost free as we start off Saturday, even if temperatures are close to freezing in many places. Now, we're going to start Saturday with those heavy showers getting going very quickly across many parts of the country. Some heavy downpours, even a rumble of thunder or two, some hail to lower levels, snow over the hills of Wales, northern England and Scotland. In the wind, it's going to feel particularly cold. Nine or ten Celsius on the thermometer, feeling more like four to six degrees in the wind. Going into Sunday, less windy to start things, although still a brisk breeze down the North Sea coast. Some sunshine early on, still a few showers before further rain arrives later. That rain heralds an unsettled start to next week and it stays cold. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? 
incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's just gone 10 to 1, and a complaint has been lodged with ITV after a senior commissioner allegedly told a panel audience, we don't want white men anymore. Well, according to the complaint seen exclusively by GB News, the executive producer made the comment. Interesting. Well, our reporter Charlie Peters, who broke the story, joins us now. Charlie, uh, frankly, this is a pretty pretty astounding piece of news. That's right, Tom, and the remark was made a couple of days ago at the Broadcast Indie Summit, an event for television executives, producers and those pitching into the industry to gather and discuss work in the industry. Now, as far as we can tell, the comment was made um, at a panel discussion where about 60 people were in the audience and the senior commissioner who works on factual entertainment pieces says we really don't want any more white men as talent. Now, we were aware of this because a complaint was sent in to ITV, seen exclusively by GB News, by an anonymous member of the audience. And they said this was not said as a joke and she did not seek to clarify her point any further. It was said as a clear instruction to the audience to not pitch white men as talent when developing new concepts for shows on ITV. They went on to say that the commissioner on behalf of ITV has briefed people from the entertainment industry that they will discriminate against people based on sex and ethnicity when casting talent for television shows on ITV. Now, this complaint said that people from all backgrounds should be given equal opportunity to apply for roles in television and casting should be based on talent, not a characteristic. This, however, they said, is the first time I have heard a senior executive explicitly state in a professional forum that they are essentially comfortable discriminating against people based on sex and ethnicity. Now, Luke shared this complaint exclusively with GB News. That's how he signed off the complaint. And he has also urged for the release of the tape of the panel. As we understand it, Broadcast Magazine, which hosted the panel, did record the gathering, but has not released that information to any people. In response to our concern, ITV has said that the panel discussion included ways to pitch new ideas and ways to further further diversify content and talent offerings. They went on to say that we aim to create and showcase content by, with and for everyone. Now, more reaction has come in today with senior backbench MPs calling for ITV to release the tapes. And we've also heard from the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who has told GB News it's a sad reflection of parts of our mainstream media class that some forms of racism and sexism are acceptable to them while others provoke utter fury. This double standard is very concerning. We should work towards inclusive and meritocratic workplaces where someone's sex or skin colour are not a factor, but rather their talent and skill. Discrimination against white people is racism too. The former Home Secretary then said discrimination against men is sexist too. This is a truth that cannot be pretended away, however creepy and self-righteous some people are about it. So very stern reactions today on this issue and many people calling for that tape to be released so we can know once and for all, did an ITV commissioner say that white men are not going to be hired as talent at the channel? Well, the tape exists. We look forward to seeing whether or not it will be released. It's interesting that they don't want to release it, seemingly. Got some thoughts on this one. Mm. We'll get to those after this quick short break. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Hi there and welcome to the forecast from the Met Office. It's going to feel cold in the wind for the rest of today in many places. Heavy showers and even some snow on the hills of northern UK. Low pressure now firmly in charge to the north of the country. Tightly packed isobars and our winds coming from the west northwest with this rain clearing for the rest of today from the southeast. Clear spells, yes, but also quite a number of showers coming in on that northwesterly wind. And those showers frequent and heavy across northwestern parts of the country. Not as many showers for the southeast, but for most places it's going to be a blustery night. And with those winds staying relatively brisk, it's going to be largely frost free as we start off Saturday, even if temperatures are close to freezing in many places. Now, we're going to start Saturday with those heavy showers getting going very quickly across many parts of the country. Some heavy downpours, even a rumble of thunder or two, some hail to lower levels, snow over the hills of Wales, Northern England and Scotland. In the wind, it's going to feel particularly cold. 9 or 10 Celsius on the thermometer, feeling more like 4 to 6 degrees in the wind. Going into Sunday, less windy to start things, although still a brisk breeze down the North Sea coast. Some sunshine early on, still a few showers before further rain arrives later. That rain heralds an unsettled start to next week. And it stays cold. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Friday, the 22nd of March. England erasure. Politicians across all parties have united to decry the outrageous decision to alter the England flag on official football shirts. Out with the red and white, in with the blues and purples. Playful update or woke nonsense? And Britain's benefits crisis worsens. The cost of sickness benefits could surge by more than a third in the next 10 years, with health and disability handouts set to rise to a whopping £90.9 billion by 2028. Has the mental health culture gone too far, as MP Mel Stride said yesterday? And can we afford this many people on benefits? Hello, hello, hello. Coppers have come calling on the Tory donor who said Diane Abbott made you want to hate all black women, despite his apology. It is raking over comments, years old comments, a good use of police time. to reply to Lorraine who's written in. Hi Lorraine. She says that we're so predictable and essentially says that we're defending the Tory donor by having this discussion about police time and that is absolutely not the case. I've said before, I said at the time, the comments clearly racist, they should be called out but there is a very difference between that mm. and the fact that he's had huge amounts of negative press about him, he's, there's been conversations about whether the money should go back, all of that fine and good. OK, but police time when police are so overstretched, mm. when they're not solving crimes, real crimes right now, mm. I think it's fair enough to have a conversation about whether this is a good use of West Yorkshire Police's time. Yeah, someone did write in to say to remind us all of the comment that Joe Brand made back in, I think it was 20... 18 or 2019 about Nigel Farage saying that she wants to throw ba battery acid or mm. something over him. Now, I, I don't think it, people genuinely believe Joe Brand wanted to throw battery acid at him, but the police didn't investigate it. Mm. Why are the police investigating Frank Hester, but they didn't investigate Joe Brand? There seems to be a... a, a, a uh, an inequality there. I mean, it may be that they're not that they're only going to investigate it for a very short time and they'll shut the case, particularly as it was five years ago. They may not find that the crime has been committed here or anything. But I do think it's worth having that conversation. So, yes. And let us know what you think. Mm. GBviews at gbnews.com. But, no, it's fundamentally... It is possible to say that the money should never be, should go back or that, 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 that society could, should condemn this guy mm. without saying that there needs to be a police investigation. Those are two different things. Two different things. Yeah, two but, different uh, things. Before getting to that and so many other stories, here are your headlines with Sam Francis. Tom, Emily, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon from the GB newsroom. Three minutes past one and the top story of the day. Rishi Sunak has now criticised Nike's alteration of the St George's Cross on its new England football kit after changing the colours to blue and purple. The company says the redesign was a playful update ahead of the Euro 2024 tournament. However, speaking earlier, the Prime Minister said the traditional red and white colours are a mark of public pride, and he said it shouldn't be messed with. Obviously, I prefer the original, and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. Well, that follows similar comments from the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, who said the multicoloured design is pointless and unnecessary. And the Labour leader, Sakia Starmer, has also urged the sports brand to revert back to the original flag's colours. We've been speaking to people outside Nike's store in central London to get their thoughts. England is England. You know, you, you start changing its colours, you start changing the flags. Yeah, it, it represents something that's traditional and perhaps it should stay that way. Yes, I like it. I cannot say more, but I think it looks, looks great. I think it could have been better. Like, I think the old shirts, like retro, I think they could have made them more like them because I think they're quite good shirts. Like, they're the best. In other news, Sir Geoffrey Cox says that Labour's projected landslide at the next general election could, he says, annihilate a credible opposition. The former Attorney General is warning that a possible win for Sir Keir Starmer would leave the Conservatives without a front bench and called it a very dangerous thing for democracy. 
In a GB News exclusive, the MP said that Rishi Sunak is a serious administrator, but suggested the Prime Minister still needs to reveal more of himself to win voters. 100 seat majority, 80 seat majority is big, but the proposal at the moment, the suggestion that, that Labour might win a 200 seat majority effectively annihilates any credible opposition. That's bad for democracy. Mm. But on our part, we need to show why. The Home Secretary has vowed to crack down on spiking by updating the law to hold perpetrators to account. Legislation in England and Wales is being changed to make it clear that it is a crime. The most recent figures show more than 560 spiking offences are reported every month, involving food, drink, needles and modified vapes. Campaigners say the true number of victims could be even higher. We know that with the drugs that are prevalent in spiking, that uh, speed is of the essence. And of course what we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls. And the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. Today, an IT worker from Essex has been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 37 years for the murder of a married couple who he worked for. Luke DeWitt poisoned Stephen and Carol Baxter with fentanyl after manipulating them with various fake personas. The couple's daughter told Chelmsford Crown Court that the 34-year-old had completely brainwashed her mother by posing as a fake doctor. Speaking outside court, Detective Inspector Lydia George said the killer went to great lengths to cover up his crimes. He clearly enjoyed the control he exerted over people, especially Carol and Stephen. Ultimately, the only person in this world who knows why he did this is Luke DeWitt, and he has proven time and time again to be a manipulator. What we do know is the significant sentence handed down is entirely fitting for the pathological liar that he is. The latest government figures have shown that more than 800 people have illegally crossed the English Channel in small boats in the past week. 263 reached UK waters yesterday alone as criminal gangs took advantage of a brief weather improvement. That surge has prompted the government to declare a migrant emergency in the Channel. And it takes the total number of crossings for the year so far to just over 4,300, up 600 more than the same time last year. Mouth cancer could soon be diagnosed painlessly with the help of flavoured lollipops. Traditional measure methods involve invasive procedures like biopsies. However, researchers say that their quicker and kinder alternative could be used in GP surgeries. Made from smart hydrogel, the lollipops capture proteins in a patient's saliva. And they say with funding from Cancer Research UK, the project could help patients to avoid painful procedures and mean earlier detection. Those are the latest headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. Good afternoon, Britain. It's eight minutes past one and the National Sickness Benefit Bill is rising, with costs set to surge by more than a third by the end of the decade. The Office for Budget Responsibility predicts that health and disability handouts will rise from £65.7 billion to £90.9 billion by 2028 to 2029, a considerable increase. Yeah, that's what, 30, 20, 25 billion increase but this comes as the work and pension secretary mel stride has warned that mental health culture has gone too far after thousands of brits have been signed off for work well professor in organizational psychology and health at the university of manchester sir carrie cooper joins us now gary thank you very much for joining us on the show today are you surprised that so many people are off sick in this country with mental health related problems no, not at all, Emily. It's been going on for quite a while. By the way, we're not the only country. The leading cause of long-term sickness absence in many developed countries now is uh, uh, what we call the common mental disorders of depression, anxiety, and stress. So right now we have about 2.8 million people who are off ill with long-term sickness. The majority of them, or the biggest single cause, is mental health. But you know what? We don't invest in mental health. 
it represents probably something like 30 or 40 percent of morbidity, i.e. illness. But yet the budget of the NHS, we haven't invested in mental health. It's probably less than 10 percent of it is dedicated to mental ill health, a big issue. And mental health, by the way, if you're off with severe depression, you're going to be off longer in most cases than you would with cancer. So we have a problem. Remember, we've changed. We used to be a big heavy manufacturing, you know, engineering kind of company. We're now a service-based uh, 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 country. And what we do is it's people. People are the issue. So take right now, we're in a recession. So people will lose their jobs because companies are going to downsize. They inevitably during, do during uh, recessionary times. And we've been bumping along the bottom anyway, economically. We're not really growing very much. So we have fewer people doing more work, feeling more job insecure, and as a consequence, working longer hours. And then we have another issue, particularly to the UK, aside from Brexit, but one other issue, which is that do we have the right kind of manager in the new world of work we're in now? Where people are working hybridly, right? Some people in the office, some people working partly from home. The evidence, by the way, on flexible working, and there's tons of it, is it is it does hit the bottom line. It's better if people want to and can, given the role they have, they, they're more, they tend to be more productive, more job satisfied, and they stay longer with the employer. It is, it is interesting looking at the numbers, because I think what you say, there's a lot of truth to what you say, and the sort of uh, need for people to have structure in their lives and all the rest of it is very, very good for us in terms of our mental health. But the rise in terms of people clocking off work, signing on for sickness benefits, started a year before the pandemic. This is what Mel Stride was pointing to this week, the Work and Pension Secretary, saying this big rise that we saw in people claiming uh, mental health sickness benefits started before the pandemic uh, by a, around a year, and it's just been rising and rising and rising ever since. It's hard to say what specifically this is, other than perhaps a general sense that we might be over-diagnosing mild conditions that really shouldn't have people leaving work. You know, Tom, what used to happen is, uh, say 10, 15 years ago, the leading cause of long-term sickness absence was musculoskeletal, backache and the like. But we all knew, a funny psychologist, we all knew that a proportion of that was really a mental health issue. In other words, because mental health was... Uh, not an acceptable thing to admit to, to admit you had depression, anxiety. There was a stigma to it. People would, when they were feeling down, really down, you know what they do? They'd say, oh, I've got this bad back. Difficult to diagnose your back, difficult to really identify. So they used to sign off on backache and those kinds of things. We always knew that ages ago because it was a stigma associated with admitting, admitting you couldn't cope with stress and everything else. Here's the other issue. If you think these people are, you know, slinging the hook, that they're just trying to get, you know, money for nothing and they're just trying to take off, here's the problem we have. As we, we're in a recession, companies are trying to keep their labor costs down. They will downsize. They did that in, in 2008. They did that in the 1980s. They downsized a lot to keep their labor costs down to be competitive. And in Britain in particular, because we have Brexit, we got to get trade deals. We got to be more competitive. So we have to keep our labor costs down. If you go to your employer, you take time off, a lot of time off on mental ill health, mm. or you're, you're using it, and you're using it for that purpose, you're going to be vulnerable to losing your job. So but my own. Carrie, opinion, well, something that's concerning, um, just lastly, is that young people are disproportionately taking time off work because of mental health. Is there not a question around whether young people are perhaps less resilient or perhaps the focus in, uh, you know, public life on, on mental health has maybe given some young people an excuse almost? I'm not saying all, but it is striking that among young people, mental health has got so much worse that there are so many more people who need to take time off work. But that's a generation, you know, Emily, that are really into talking about issues that trouble them. OK, yeah, if we had the right facilities, here's what we need to do in the UK. We need to identify people early and we need to give them treatment. You go with an anxiety problem or a depression problem. Try to get an appointment with your GP. 
you get an appointment with your GP, then try to find a mental health professional to help you. you it might take months, absolute months. So unless we in, invest a lot more in, in the mental health facilities that we don't have in the NHS now, so we can get early identification, early treatment, that's what we need. They're not slinging the lead. Mm. These young people want to work, but they're prepared to talk about their problems. They want to get help. I don't think we can generalise either way. No. I don't think we can generalise entirely either way. So there may be lots of young people who are desperate to work but have awful mental health problems and they're not getting the help they need. But there may also be some who perhaps are taking what they consider an easy way out. We don't know exactly. Mm. We don't know. But I doubt we can say all young people, all young people, Oh, no, people, I'm not saying that, but, that, but I, I think the proportion is smaller than you're making okay. out. Mm. OK, that's fair, that's fair. Really interesting to talk to you, really interesting. You so, Kari Cooper, care, um, Take care, Tom. Professor in Thank Organisational you. Psychology and Health at the University of Manchester. Yes, no, interesting stuff. And uh, I, I hadn't considered the backache thing. Mm. You did used to hear yeah. a lot more about backache. That's didn't interesting. You? Yeah. Yes, when actually it might have been a mental health problem yeah, that was the, the things, most pressing issue. Yeah, yeah very good working point. Working their way into other issues. Uh, but a hospital in Manchester, in other news, is investigating allegations its staff treated a nine year old child incompetently because he was Jewish. Yes, the uncle claims his nephew was made to lie on the floor when he wore his kipper. But on a different occasion, when he was not wearing his kipper, and was, quote, visibly Jewish, he received quick care. So the allegation is essentially that this boy was marked out as Jewish mm. and was therefore treated differently and treated badly. But what you're looking at now, this is the police are investigating a man for an arson attack here that occurred yesterday on a house in Hackney. During his arrest, the man reportedly made comments that were deemed to be anti-Semitic. So there are concerns this was an anti-Semitic hate crime too. So there seem to be multiple incidents mm. here. There are different instances whereby things are clearly slightly off, slightly uncomfortable, and perhaps nakedly anti-Semitic in this country. Well, joining us now is Stephen Silverman, Director of Investigations and Enforcement at the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. Thank you for making the time for us this afternoon. I, I wonder, are you seeing a precipitated rise in instances like this? Yeah, I mean, we absolutely are. And uh, with regards to the hospital incident, um, we are in direct touch, not just with patients who we use, Jewish patients who are using the NHS, but Jewish healthcare practitioners within the NHS who are deeply concerned about the hostile environment that's being created for them. Um, they tell us that they are concerned that uh, the BMA is taking a one-sided approach to what is happening in the Middle East, and that is worsening that environment for them. Uh, I've heard awful uh, stories directly from doctors. Um, for example, a, a patient due to undergo an invasive procedure that is routinely done under sedation, who insisted on having it without the sedation mm. because they were too scared not to be alert throughout the procedure. So, yeah, it is a massively growing problem, not just within this hospital and within the this NHS trust, but around the NHS. I mean, they say that there were, that this boy, this Jewish boy, uh, was being treated by a number of pro-Palestine nurses, uh, visibly pro-Palestine nurses. So I guess the allegation here is that not only were they anti-Semitic, but also this could be politically motivated, wanted to treat this boy um, differently because he's Jewish and because clearly they've got very strong opinions about the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, it's truly shocking that when, if it's true that when he was visibly Jewish, as his uh, uncle has said, that he was treated so differently from when he wasn't wearing his kipper. I mean, it's outrageous that this is happening in modern Britain in 2024, that someone would be treated such a way. Um, do you know how it's being investigated internally? Do you know what's going on there? No, I'm sure that the, the Trust will be applying its usual, dis uh, its usual procedures for investigating matters such as these. But, you know, th th there's one thing I'd like to say. I mean, it has not been uh, definitively proven that that was the motivation. But mm. clearly, it's important to understand what the Jewish experience is when they walk into a hospital and see um, people displaying the flag of the Palestinian Authority on their, on their uniforms. The Palestinian Authority pays 
terrorists who murder Jews in terrorist attacks in Israel a salary. There's a sliding scale depending on how many people they murder. Um, the Palestinian Authority has overseen the distribution of virulently anti-Semitic material throughout its entire education system, and it was directly involved in the celebrations of the atrocity of the 7th of October. Now, Jewish patients should not be having to wonder about the political views of the person mm. treating them. I didn't they shouldn't know be that having they were to allowed, worry Stephen, the sorry, who... I didn't know that NHS staff were allowed to uh, wear such things that could be deemed well, I don't know the are, but I didn't be... know that that was allowed. I don't know what the rules are, but there should be absolutely no political symbols worn mm. by NHS staff or indeed any staff. Stephen, what do you say to those staff who might say, we don't ascribe to every single uh, objective of the, or, or indeed practice of the Palestinian Authority. We don't um, follow the politics of this, but we do believe that there should be a Palestinian state and perhaps having this flag, and I've seen the lanyards in Parliament, I mean, I've seen, I'm sure they're, they're, they're all over the place. Uh, can you always ascribe the idea that just because someone shows that flag, they necessarily believe in some of the horrific practices that are carried out in the name of that flag? Well, I mean, obviously, um, advocating for a Palestinian state isn't in itself anti-Semitic. Uh, but the place to do it is not in a place of work. There should be no political symbols in a place of work, certainly not in the NHS. Um, they should have their uniforms, their name badges, and and, and that's it. Yeah. And, you know, the, you're right. We, but the problem is when somebody displays that flag, a Jewish person looks at that and wonders, and they should not have to be w wondering whether the person who is treating them... Uh, sympathises with Hamas and with the worst massacre of Jews since the There has the to be one That's rule, the doesn't issue. there, really? There has to be one rule, because otherwise you could rock up in any type of political statement, and it's not appropriate when, of course, people... You know, we have a universal health system in this country where everyone has to be treated very much the same. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your time. Really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Stephen Silverman, Director of Investigations and Enforcement at the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. Yeah, I should say that GB News has reached out for comment and we're waiting to hear back, but we do have a statement from the hospital below. Uh, we are aware of images and very serious claims which are circulating on social media. We are rapidly investigating these to establish the situation and are discussing them with the family involved. Royal Manchester Children's Hospital is committed to providing high-quality care to all our patients. Well, there you go. That's what the hospital has so far said. We'll bring you any update as we get it. But in other news, the FA is under fire, of course, because it altered the official England flag on football shirts, with many saying the football association's gone woke or just completely mad. Is it much ado about nothing, though? Some people are saying, you know, not a big deal. Not a big deal. It's just a little playful update. Hmm. Well, we'll be having that debate, that uh, fiery debate, <laughs> after this. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, cos I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay. They show up for work. There's a protection they are owed. 
beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be there. Should be a penalty for that. Well, for the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to, use if you it. commit, there's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is no, but there is an offer because at there the end of the day, like you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, that's an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 1.26, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, anger is continuing to bubble about the FA and Nike's decision to change the St George's flag on England's new football kit. Or indeed Nike's decision. All right. The, the flag on the back collar of the shirts has been modified using purple and blue horizontal stripes in what the manufacturers called a playful update. So I wonder if they're going to stick to that. Mm. A playful update is what they call it. But many others have criticised the change. Kistam has got involved. He's called it wrong. And the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, says it's pointless and unnecessary. I feel like this is the sort of question that politicians are actually enjoying. They actually like being asked this, don't right, they? They, they, all they can seem all to add agree. something different. But one politician today has gone a step further. In the last few minutes, Cabinet Minister Penny Mordaunt has offered to collect complaints about Nike's New England kit and take them to the US company. Gosh, but she's really getting involved, stepping it up, isn't she? It really she? is. It's almost as if she sort of wants to raise her profile in well, some sort of way. Maybe, maybe. But is this all much ado about nothing? Should we really be worrying ourselves about a, a little colourful update to the back of a football shirt? We shall see. Joining well, us now is... GB News presenter Martin Daubney, who thinks the change is outrageous, and political commentator Andy McDonald, who thinks the issue is being blown out of proportion. Well, Martin, you kicked this all off. Let's start with you. Yeah, so when this kit was announced on Monday, I jumped straight on it. I thought it was total sacrilege. And it's turned into actually the biggest political own goal for Nike in history. It's united politicians of all stripes. It's united football fans of all colour stripes. Don't mess with flags, whatever the flag any flag to do so fundamentally misunderstands several things. Firstly, football fans. Football fans don't want this. Second, patriotism. Patriots of any nation don't want their flag meddling with. Thirdly, the vast majority of football fans are working class and they don't share the liberal makeover beliefs of people like the Nike team who think this is playful. It's mm. not playful. It's totally disrespectful and it has no place in the game. Why target the English specifically though, that's the interesting bit. Mm. Because the St George's Cross, St George's Day is routinely lambasted as racist, divisive, a nationalism to be ashamed of rather than be a proud of. Nike have absolutely shot themselves in the foot. It's been a disaster. Well, a strong opening statement there from you, Martin. I'll put that to you, Andy. If you don't think this is a big deal, then you misunderstand football fans, you misunderstand patriots, and you misunderstand the working class. Well, well, there you go. Uh, that's quite the uh, quite the bold statement there. I'm, I'm not too sure that I, I misunderstand the working class patriotic football fan. You know, uh, realistically, we talk about class. The football shirts are way too expensive for normal working class people to buy anyway. You know, they're like 120 quid for the top tier one, 80 quid for the normal one. So, you know, if you're trying to bring it into a class issue, they're too expensive anyway. This is like ridiculous. You know, Penny Morden, she's trying to run for prime minister, so she's making a big do about it. Politicians need to get back to the stories that really matter. 
you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. This is leading the agenda for, what, two, three days on the trot? Martin, it, 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 Martin, it, 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 these shirts boring. are so expensive that this is really a niche elitist issue. It's not. It, this is an issue of the terraces, and the terraces don't share the same polite society attitudes as the boardroom or as the liberal press or the mainstream media. Even if you don't buy a shirt, and many fans may not buy a shirt, they will see this as an affront. Why change a flag? Nike also do the Saudi Arabia flag. You think they'll change their flag? Of course they won't. Mm. They've gone for the English flag, and I think there's something specific in that. Englishness is open game. It's fair game to be attacked, be it our monuments, our former prime ministers, our, our, our patron saint. Whatever it is about England, it's OK. And when you complain, you're a gammon. You know, grow a pair. Stop being so sensitive. Try it with any nation on earth, and I warrant the fans would do the same. Andy, you, you smirked. You smirked. Can I just put that to... And they deserve to get it in the neck. Yeah, can I put that to Andy? Because, Andy, you did, you did smirk a little bit. You clearly think that Martin is going over the top on this one. But can you understand that, actually, there are a lot of English people who feel like their flag isn't exactly celebrated, let's say? Sure, uh, and, and I appreciate that. But, I mean, let, let's be real here. It's an inch by a half inch of colour on the back of someone's neck. Like, it's not like they've gone for the crest of the three lines. You know what I mean? Like, nobody's probably even going to see it in the games because it, it's so small. It's it's really not that deep. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the England flag has been desecrated by many, many liberal elite board rumours, as Martin claims. But this just isn't that big of a deal. There are bigger stories, more important things to be talking about than uh, an inch by half inch on the back of a football player's neck. Martin. Well, just, that just shows that you just do not understand the mindset of the football fan. You do not understand the mindset of the proud, patriotic Englishman and woman who are talking about this in their droves. Get out, get out from the BBC or from the Guardian. Go into a Weatherspoons. People are talking about this non-stop. It does matter to them. It's not just a little logo on the back of a shirt. It's a gradual drip, drip, drip erosion of what it means to be British, to be English, to have our culture desecrated instead of respected. This would never mm. be a throwaway issue if it was the Jamaican shirt mm. or another shirt. You know it, but the English well, shirt, that's, it's that's fair not... game. Well, that's Martin, not, we started with you, so let's finish with Andy. Andy, isn't the point here that this is an international competition? This is Euros 2024. This is all about representing your country on the world stage. Isn't national identity important in this instance? Uh, of course, national identity is important, particularly on the international stage. But you look at the Olympics in 2012, the Union flag on the uh, British shirts was completely changed. Regularly, the Jamaican flag is changed uh, in the Olympics. You know, flags aren't just you know this kind of objective thing that can't be touched. Regularly, we see in international sporting events, they get modified, they get changed for artistic purposes. It's not that big of a deal. OK, so you think it's a playful update. Martin certainly does not. Thank you. That was a fantastic head-to-head. -head. Uh, Martin Dobney there, he'll be on at 3 o'clock. He's just getting ready. This is a <laughs> little warm-up. Warm up, just warm-up. Warm warm-up round, warm-up um, round. And thank Andy McDonald, thank you very much. Now, Nike has got in touch to say that the England 2024 home kit disrupts history with a modern take on a classic. The trim on the cuffs takes its cues from the training gear worn by England's 1966 heroes with a gradient of blues and reds topped by purple. The same colours also feature an interpretation of the flag of St George on the back of the collar. Well, there you go. Are you convinced? Let us know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.com. But coming up, we'll be hearing what you think. Our reporter has been on the ground for us, talking to all the people who may be popping into the Nike shop, or will they not be Nike. popping in? <laughs> will they not be popping in? Perhaps they won't. All right, all we'll right. We'll get to that after your headlines. Tom, Emily, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom 133. And a recap of that top story leading the news today that Rishi Sunak has now criticised Nike's alteration of the St George's Cross on its new England football kit. The redesign featuring purple and blue stripes has, as you've been hearing, sparked backlash with the Change.org petition already gaining over 21,000 signatures. The Nike company says that the update was, though, a playful update ahead of the Euro 2024 tournament. However, speaking earlier, the Prime Minister said the traditional red and white colours are a mark of public pride and that it shouldn't be messed with.
Obviously, I prefer the original, and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. A man who's been described as a loner has been jailed for life for the murder of a couple he worked for by poisoning them with fentanyl. Luke DeWitt invented fake personas and rewrote the will of Stephen and Carol Baxter, who were in their 60s, to take charge of their company. The couple's daughter told Chelmsford Crown Court that the 34-year-old killer had completely brainwashed her mother by posing as a fake doctor. He was sentenced today and will serve a minimum of 37 years. The latest government figures show more than 800 people have illegally crossed the English Channel in small boats in the past week. 263 reached UK waters on Thursday alone as criminal gangs took advantage of a brief weather improvement. The surge has prompted the government to declare a migrant emergency in the channel and it takes the total number of crossings for the year so far to just over 4,300. That's 600 more than the same time last year. The Prime Minister has refused to comment on police investigations into alleged racist comments made by a Conservative Party donor. West Yorkshire police say they are now looking at whether a crime was committed by Frank Hester. It's reported that he told a meeting in 2019 that the MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and he said that she should be shot. And Nationwide has apologised to customers after all payments in and out of accounts were delayed this morning. It says there was an issue impacting the faster payment system, but it has since been fixed. Those are the headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or visit our website, gbnews.com alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2620 and €1.1657. The price of gold is £1,724.24 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,924 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Hi there and welcome to the forecast from the Met Office. It's going to feel cold in the wind for the rest of today in many places. Heavy showers and even some snow on the hills of northern UK. Low pressure now firmly in charge to the north of the country. Tightly packed isobars and our winds coming from the west northwest with this rain clearing for the rest of today from the southeast. Clear spells, yes, but also quite a number of showers coming in on that northwesterly wind. And those showers frequent and heavy across northwestern parts of the country. Not as many showers for the southeast, but for most places it's going to be a blustery night. And with those winds staying relatively brisk, it's going to be largely frost free as we start off Saturday, even if temperatures are close to freezing in many places. Now, we're going to start Saturday with those heavy showers getting going very quickly across many parts of the country. Some heavy downpours, even a rumble of thunder or two, some hail to lower levels, snow over the hills of Wales, northern England and Scotland. In the wind, it's going to feel particularly cold. 9 or 10 Celsius on the thermometer, feeling more like 4 to 6 degrees in the wind. Going into Sunday, less windy to start things, although still a brisk breeze down the North Sea coast. Some sunshine early on, still a few showers before further rain arrives later. That rain heralds an unsettled start to next week and it stays cold. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 1.40, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain with me, Emily and Tom. So, let's return to the Nike shirt route. Oh, gosh, I said Nike, didn't yes. I? Yes. Yeah, okay, you See, win. I know you, you know win. it's Nike, you and win. you just say you Nike win. to annoy me. You, you do it deliberately, I know this. I'm being contrary. <laughs> Conservatives, Labour and Liberal Democrats have united in criticising the decision to give the St George's Cross a playful update. Martin Dobney is furious about this. Mm. I'm sure he'll be talking about it later on his show, that's for sure. Well, someone else who's furious is the leader of the opposition. Sir Keir Starmer told The Sun that he thinks they should just reconsider and change it back. As previously, search had regu shirts had regularly featured the red and white St George's flag, which is the only St George's flag. Well, yes, quite. <laughs> now, Lee Anderson was on GB News earlier. Should we have a listen to what he had to say about this? The England team taking the knee. Then we've got the England captain wearing rainbow armbands. Hypocrites, a lot of them. Now we've got this nonsense. Where does it stop? It's a slippery slope. The FA should hang their heads in shame. Well, well, there you go. They should hang their heads in shame. And we sent our reporter, Theo Jacomba, to Nike Town in central London. Uh, now, Theo, uh, what's the feeling on the ground? <laughs> yeah, well, mixed emotions here from people we've been speaking to here in central London. But we've had some strong words from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, today. Don't mess with the flag on the England shirt. Alongside many other politicians we've heard from today, all on the same side. And this is the day before the England and Brazil match taking place at Wembley tomorrow. Normally, on days like today, we're talking about who's going to be featuring, are there any injuries. Even though it is a friendly match, it's a big game when some of England's best players uh, come together. And they'll be facing a mighty Brazil uh, with players who play in some of the best teams across the world. But of of course, the story today is that flag and new colours on it. Some saying it shouldn't have changed at all, and others saying actually it's representative of the society we live in today. Here's what some of the people we've spoken to have had to say this afternoon. England is England. You know, you, you start changing its colours, you start changing the flags. Yeah, it, it represents something that's traditional, and perhaps it should stay that way. Being Welsh, I'm not really bothered, <laughs> to be honest. But... England's England, so it should be the original St George's Cross. I think it could have been better. Like, I think the old shirts, like retro, I think they could have made them more like them because I think they're quite good shirts. Like, they're the best. Why change it? Why change it? It's a part of England, isn't it? So I don't know quite why they're changing it all of a sudden. It's not cheap to, fa to it's fair to say it's definitely not cheap. £124.99 for the shirt with no shorts, no socks, just the shirt itself. It's not cheap, but of course that flag is on it. The new shirt will be no doubt worn in the matches to come. Potentially we might see it uh, tomorrow in that game against Brazil. But this morning we first heard from uh, the le leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, saying the flag is used by everybody. It is a unifier and it doesn't need to be changed. We've been hearing that from many others today, but the question does remain here, though. Uh, should it have changed or should it simply uh, stay as it is? And does it represent uh, the society we live in? Mm, well, Theo Chikomba, thank you for bringing us those voices there outside of uh, one of the largest Nike shops in the land. Yes, um, Nike is very popular, oh, but will this shirt again. be? Will this shirt be? Will more people buy it, do you think, because of all of this hoo-ha, or fewer people? Mm, interesting. And will they change the design? Will they bow to public pressure and Can political pressure? Can they do that now? Pressure? Have they already made them all? 
Well, I don't know. Well, it won't be them making it, will it? It'll be... Um... Sweatshops. Oh, I, was, I, was I have no say, idea. You can't of, make such an allegation. No, I can't make those We don't know where they're made. Um, but, but, but fundamentally, 125 quid for a shirt, or as Theo rightly said, not 100, 124 pounds and 99 pence. Excellent. It makes, it makes it seem so much cheaper, doesn't it? Yeah, I know for a lot of parents, um, you know, they've got children who beg them for these mm. shirts, you know, always wanting the new one, always wanting the most expensive kit. And it's a lot of money, but people do save up for a long time. I remember my, uh, I think my, my brother was always wanting one. Mm. Always, always demanding a new shirt, but uh, I'm mm. not sure if how often he got one. I certainly didn't get one every time it changed. No, no. Well, we'll, do, be, uh, we'll, we'll be do. discussing uh, much more after the break, not least the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, him again. He's refused seven times to deny taking any drugs while at university. Of course, he was director of public prosecutions for some years, including prosecuting people involved in drugs. Well, we'll be talking about all of this after the break. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9pm. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not... He is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's coming up to 10 to 2. Uh, now, should politicians be more transparent, even more transparent than they already are, when it comes to questions around their past? Why do we talk about this? Last night, Sir Keir Starmer refused seven times to say whether or not he'd taken illegal drugs in his past, saying simply... 
he had fun while he was at university. Yes, it's interesting, isn't there? There seemed to be a wave of politicians coming out and admitting that they'd taken drugs at one time or another, usually always talking about the university days or it was know, the, the days of their youth. I remember the week this happened. It was the 2019 Conservative leadership election. Yeah. And one candidate got asked whether they'd taken illegal drugs. It was the Michael Gove scandal. Mm. It, was the, it was the bombshell claims about Michael Gove. And then every other candidate in that leadership election, every single one, couldn't get through an interview without being asked, have you ever taken illegal drugs? And then Rory Stewart blew the whole thing open when he said, when he, said he had... Um, what was it? it he, he said he'd, he'd tried... I don't want to libel anyone, so I'm not going to say the specific thing, but some rather exotic cocktail when he was abroad in one of the exotic well, places that do you know he was previously it's, lived in. Oh, gosh, well, I mean... Do, well, Jeremy, do you, Jeremy do you Hunt want, said he had a cannabis uh, lassie. That I guess one we've I got a few questions for, for you at home. Do you, do you want to know whether politicians have ever dabbled in illegal substances? Do you think we have the right to know? Should they be more transparent? Because mm. I guess the argument is that they make the law, and we do have a war on drugs, or so at least we have a drug policy, yeah. um, and it is illegal. Well, well, this is, this so, is... you know, should politicians who are making the laws abide by the laws, and do we have every right to know, even if it was mm. years and years and years ago, whether they have uh, dabbled? There's, there's two things on this. This is the thing that I think angers me the most about it all. Go on. That uh, I, d I don't actually mind if politicians in their youth have, have dabbled in this mm. or that. What I do mind is inconsistency and hypocrisy. And if you're a politician who is upholding this, 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 what I think is a broken approach to how we approach drugs in this country, it would be much, much better if we approached uh, these issues in a, in a health way, as they do in Portugal. Because you don't like the than... sort of say as I... say, Do what I say, it's, not it's, what it's I do. It's politicians actually. upholding yeah. laws that put people behind bars for doing exactly what they do. Upholding laws that ruin lives for doing what they did when they were younger. Well, let us know at home. Do you think it's um, hypocrisy in action if, as a politician, you support a crackdown on, on drugs but actually have taken them yourself in the past? Do we deserve to know more? Should they be more transparent or could you not care less? Mm. Anyway, moving on. Sir Keir Starmer has taken a £50 bet that Lee Anderson will lose his parliamentary seat in the next general election. Yes, a Mirror journalist asked him if he thought that Mr Anderson would retain his seat, to which the Labour leader replied... No, I don't. Asked if he would bet on it, he accepted the 50 quid bet with a handshake. Now, is this appropriate? Let's speak to Justin Larkham, a recovered gambling addict and author of the book Tales I Lose. Hello, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, do you think this is appropriate for our politicians, people in positions of power, to be making these types of casual bets on, on policy and the like? Well, I really don't. I absolutely don't. And to go back to your previous uh, story, um, politicians uh, engaging in things that are really quite harmful. Um, from my own perspective, uh, I had an addiction to online gambling, which I, I lost everything. I had 10 years in the army, 10 years working in the city. I had everything. Uh, and in three years, I lost it all to an addiction to online gambling. 380,000 problem gamblers in the UK. Nine people affected by every single problem gambler. Three and a half million at risk. And to be light-hearted and jokey and shaking hands about something that, frankly, shouldn't be related to politics, I find really quite painful. I can understand your position, and, and, and it must be a, a really tough thing for many people who are susceptible to this to go through. But we do live in a society where there are lots of elements of gambling, whether it's a, a, twin, a coin toss or, or a handshake over this and... and, 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 and a, 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 can, can, we, can we find a way to, to, to talk about responsible gambling in a responsible way, or, or must we sort of shut it all down? No, that's a brilliant word. A responsible gambling is absolutely what we should do. I'm not anti-gambling, not at all. Mm. Um, I'm just very much aware that I, uh, I could never gamble again. Um, just as an alcoholic, having one drink, if I had one bet, I'd be right back to where I was. Mm. Um, and I think um, we need responsible gambling. And it's, it's a shame that the people that make the laws uh, and regulations around gambling in the UK uh, seem to have quite a, a light-hearted view about Justin, it. Justin, could would you go as far as to say that this might, these sort of casual bets might act as a trigger? for people with gambling very, very problems, could so, they? Very much so. Yeah, I, I did. I watched both those interviews um, with, with both uh, uh, the, the leader and, um, and Keir Starmer. And um, 
I, I felt that, you know, it, it was just a handshake. But just a handshake, I couldn't even do that. I could not, I have to turn down bets frequently. Um, sweepstakes at work, um, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the my son's rugby team, uh, you know, ha having, a, having a bet and the coach before the game. Um, I, I can't do it. And a casual bet is just the same as any other bet um, for a problem gambler. Mm -hmm. And it could easily be a trigger for someone it's, to get it's, back. It's interesting because there was obviously, this, very quickly, Rishi Sunak bet a thousand pounds on uh, migration policy. Starmer bet 50 quid. Does it matter to you that the, the level at which these bets are taken? No, uh, for me, uh, and I do have to say that I'm talking from a personal perspective here, mm. I couldn't do any of that. I, I mm. couldn't even... Uh, the, the handshake we call a sportsman's bet, so something you might do in a, a game of golf, um, mm. or, or any other sport, really. I couldn't even do but that. It's a, a, bet's a, bet. it's a bet's a bet. A bet's a bet, essentially. Thank Absolutely you very much. Right. Really interesting perspective. Hadn't thought about okay. it that way. Justin Larkham, recovered gambling addict and author of the book Tales I Lose. Coming up, though, a police launch an investigation into alleged comments made by a Tory donor. Is that a good use of police time? A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hi there and welcome to the forecast from the Met Office. It's going to feel cold in the wind for the rest of today in many places. Heavy showers and even some snow on the hills of northern UK. Low pressure now firmly in charge to the north of the country. Tightly packed isobars and our winds coming from the west, northwest, with this rain clearing for the rest of today from the southeast. Clear spells, yes, but also quite a number of showers coming in on that northwesterly wind. And those showers frequent and heavy across northwestern parts of the country. Not as many showers for the southeast, but for most places it's going to be a blustery night. And with those winds staying relatively brisk, it's going to be largely frost free as we start off Saturday, even if temperatures are close to freezing in many places. Now, we're going to start Saturday with those heavy showers getting going very quickly across many parts of the country. Some heavy downpours, even a rumble of thunder or two, some hail to lower levels, snow over the hills of Wales, northern England and Scotland. In the wind, it's going to feel particularly cold. 9 or 10 Celsius on the thermometer, feeling more like 4 to 6 degrees in the wind. Going into Sunday, less windy to start things, although still a brisk breeze down the North Sea coast. Some sunshine early on, still a few showers before further rain arrives later. That rain heralds an unsettled start to next week, and it stays cold. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays eight till nine on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's two o'clock on Friday, the 22nd of March. England, Eurasia, politicians across all parties have united to decry the outrageous decision to alter the England flag on official football shirts. Out with the red and white we go, in with the blues and purples. Playful update or woke nonsense? Hello, hello, hello. Coppers have come calling on the Tory donor who said Diane Abbott makes you want to hate all black women, despite his apology. Is raking over years old comments a good use of police time? And mayhem in Milton Keynes. Plans to build 63,000 homes are wreaking havoc in the area as locals fear such. The increase in properties will destroy their picturesque countryside. We'll hear from the MP himself from Milton Keynes South. Now, I've got a problem with how Milton Keynes is built. Oh, gosh, OK, go on. It wastes so much space. You go there and you just see these enormous concrete car parks. And then there'll be a field in between them. There'll be a bit of greenery. Yeah. And then there'll be another big slab of concrete. What's wrong with that? It, it sprawls. It sprawls over so much land Maybe that it doesn't like it need to way. sprawl across. Maybe they like it that it's, way. It's not a nice way to build a community because everything's miles away. If you just do concrete green concrete, it's not a green place, yeah, but, it's yeah, a horrible Tom, mismatch. Tom, you've said this and you've said this online too and what's happened, the people of Milton Keynes are saying that you're wrong. And everyone else so, is saying that so I'm right. shall we trust Tom, who's been to Milton Keynes a couple of times in his Lots life? Lots of times. Or should we trust the people who actually live there? Because I say probably to Milton the people Keynes there. Tonight. Take, for example, Sarah. She says, I was born in Milton Keynes, have lived in Milton Keynes all my life. My in-laws live in Hanslop and I have family in Castlethorpe. These are two villages that may be impacted mm. by all of these new houses. Houses. She says it's quintessential, quintessentially English village, and we're aware of the houses which will engulf the area. She says she's amazed at the ignorance of people who do not live in an area who then seek to spout incorrect information. Tom. Nothing incorrect about my characterisation of the centre of Milton Keynes, which is sprawling concrete, roads everywhere, warehouse-type buildings, big, big, big concrete car parks. Well, you don't have it's, to live there, do you? Well, no, but you could fit. You could you could densify the whole thing. You could actually take up less land with more houses if it was built like 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 Maida Vale or like Pimlico, with grand boulevards of, well, of charming of charming terraced houses, maybe five or six stories tall apiece, and you had rows upon rows of those with parks in between. That all would, right, all right, that all would right. house many more people in much less space. OK, well, um, not sure what to ask you at home. Should Tom stop talking about Milton Keynes <laughs> as if he lives there, as if he has any idea what it's like to live in Milton Keynes? But, yes, yeah, 63,000 new homes in Milton Keynes. Um, what do you make Very of that? Very odd place. What do you make of that? Very odd place. It's your headlines. <laughs>
Tom, Emily, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom just after two o'clock. I have lived in Milton Keynes, but I will remain impartial. Rishi Sunak has criticised Nike's alteration of the St George's Cross on its New England football kit after changing the colours from blue and purple. The company says the redesign was a playful update ahead of the Euro 2024 tournament in June. However, speaking earlier, the Prime Minister said that the traditional red and white colours are a mark of public pride and that it shouldn't be messed with. Obviously, I prefer the original and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. Well, that follows similar comments from the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, who said that the multicoloured design is pointless and unnecessary. And the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, has also urged the sports brand to revert to the original flag's colours. We've been speaking to people here in London outside Nike's store on Oxford Street to get their thoughts. England is England, you know, you, you start changing its colours, you start changing the flags. Yeah, it, it represents something that's traditional and perhaps it should stay that way. Yes, I like it. I cannot say more, but I think it looks, looks great. I think it could have been better. Like, I think the old shirts, like retro, I think they could have made them more like them because I think they're quite good shirts, like, they're the best. Sir Geoffrey Cox says that Labour's projected landslide at the next general election could annihilate a credible opposition. The former Attorney General is warning that a possible win for Sir Keir Starmer would leave the Conservatives without a front bench and called it a very dangerous thing for democracy. In a GB News exclusive, the MP said that Rishi Sunak is a serious administrator but suggested the Prime Minister still needs to reveal more of himself to win over voters. 100 seat majority, 80 seat majority is big, but the proposal at the moment, the suggestion that, that Labour might win a 200 seat majority effectively annihilates any credible opposition. That's bad for democracy. Mm. But on our part, we need to show why. The Home Secretary has vowed to crack down on spiking by updating the law to hold perpetrators to account. Legislation in England and in Wales is being changed to make it clear that it's a crime. The most recent figures show more than 560 spiking offences are reported every month involving food, drink, needles and modified vapes. Campaigners, though, say the true number of victims could be even higher. We know that with the drugs that are prevalent in spiking, that uh, speed is of the essence. And, of course, what we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls and the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. Today, an IT worker from Essex has been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 37 years for the murder of a married couple who he used to work for. Luke DeWitt poisoned Stephen and Carol Baxter with fentanyl after manipulating them with various fake personas. The couple's daughter told Chelmsford Crown Court that the 34-year-old had completely brainwashed her mother by posing as a fake doctor. The latest government figures show that more than 800 people have illegally crossed the English Channel in small boats in just the past week. 263 reached UK waters on Thursday alone as criminal gangs took advantage of brief weather improvements. The surge has prompted the government to declare a migrant emergency in the Channel and it takes the total number of crossings for the year so far to 4,300. That's 600 more than the same time last year. And finally, five alleged members of a spy ring have denied plotting to carry out surveillance in the UK on behalf of Russia over a period of two and a half years. The group of Bulgarians appeared at the Old Bailey accused of espionage and possessing fake identity documents, including passports and identity cards for at least eight countries. They are due to face trial in October alongside a sixth alleged plotter who was also implicated but did not enter a plea. Those are the headlines. More to come with Tom and Emily throughout the next hour. But in the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts.
Right, it's 2.08 in the afternoon and the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has refused to comment on the police investigation into the alleged racist comments made by Tory party donor Frank Hester. Yeah, this comes as Mr Hester's alleged racist comments from 2019 are being investigated by West Yorkshire Police. Now, a spokesperson for the force said officers were now working to establish the facts and to ultimately ascertain whether a crime has been committed. Hopefully they can do that quite quickly. Well, you'd hope, wouldn't you? Should we get some more on this with our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, joining us live now from Westminster? Because, Olivia, this will have come as an unwelcome surprise to many people uh, in the building depicted behind you who sort of thought this story had gone away. But no, here it comes back with a police well... investigation. Absolutely. I mean, it is a huge headache for Rishi Sunak. Just if you'll cast your minds back to a couple of weeks ago when this scandal all kicked off, uh, it was reported to The Guardian that Frank Hester, a Conservative Party donor who's donated about £10 million to the party, made some comments, in uh, racist comments, in 2019. Now... Over the next couple of days, Rishi Sunak and his ministers stopped short of actually saying that those comments were racist until Kemi Badenoch, one cabinet minister, uh, bit the bullet and said that, no, in fact, what Frank Hester said was racist. Sure enough, other government ministers then uh, filed in behind her, said that those comments were racist, and slowly but surely it felt as though the story was ebbing away. Now, though, it is back in the headlines once again because West Yorkshire Police have opened an investigation to see if a crime was committed when Frank Hester allegedly made these comments. Now, it's difficult for Rishi Sunak, not only because, obviously, the Conservative Party accepting £10 million from, uh, from a racist would be a, a very bad look indeed, but also because it, it, it brings this, it rakes back through this entire story, which was a pretty bad episode in Rishi Sunak's uh, premiership. He failed to show leadership. He failed to show the leadership uh, required to come forward first and say that these comments were racist. And for that, he got a lot of flack, both from backbenchers and from the public. So it's a real headache for him that this, this has come out again, particularly as over 50% of the population already think that the Conservative Party should hand back that 10 million pounds mm. and if this investigation drags on then that percentage is very likely to go up well mm. thank you very much indeed olivia um yes another headache for rishi sunak we seem to say headache for rishi sunak nearly every day um, yes, at yes, the moment too. but we'll see how this police investigation goes should we speak to um Wayman bennett from stand up to racism that's a group campaigning against racism fascism islamophobia and anti-semitism um wayman yeah. you have welcomed this police investigation, am I right? I think that, you know, everybody's equal in front of the law. And um, it's one of the best things that could be done is an investigation into seeing if it was incitement and um, that Mr Hester's held accountable for his words and deeds. And that's what we'd expect by British law. Um, I think one of the things that is disappointing is that, as you said, the failure of the Prime Minister to call out racism has actually made it worse because there would have been probably a means of just sending the money back and condemning it, and that would have drawn a line under it. But unfortunately, he hasn't done that. Uh, and to be honest with you, neither has Mr Starmer played a very good role in backing up his own MP in saying that there should be some kind of investigation because we want to get rid of, as you said, racism, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. We want to build a British society in which that's not a feature of it. Mm. It's an ongoing work of progress. Wait, but this wait, is wait something which... How do you think it helps? How do you think it helps to litigate comments from five years ago that have been apologised for already? Do you think that's more or less likely for everyone to be able to move forward together from? Or, or, or might this actually be a fairly divisive thing for the police to do, to, to police language like this? Well, well, the reason why I think it should be looked at is because, um, you know, he's clearly a major donor to the Conservative Party. Um, there is a connection between public services. It's our taxes that funds his company. He's a major contributor to his company from the, from the NHS. And we have standards to uphold. And I believe if the NHS is the, his main profit from which he comes from, which is, is a multiracial... How, how, uh, how, how does that relate force, to a police to... investigation to his comments? Well, 
Well, because what one of the things that has to be established is that he made the comments, and if they if it reaches the threshold of whether it's criminal, because at the moment it's as allegations, isn't it, that he's made the comments, mm -hmm. right? One of the things that could be done, I think, if someone makes open racist statements. Which is illegal, actually. I mean, it is illegal to be racist. I know some racists don't understand that. It, it, it actually is illegal to incite racial hatred. Oh, that's against different. People. Yeah, but to be honest with you, when you talk about shooting a black women because they're black women, the question is, does that cross the threshold of inciting racial hatred? That's down to the CPS and down to the police. Um, but what I do think is very clear is that it should be investigated if people believe that crime has been committed. Wait a minute, if he, was, if he was just an average Joe and he wasn't a donor to the Conservative Party and someone who's received contracts from the government for various things, um, do you think the police should investigate? So if it was just some random bloke who'd said this on, on the street or... On in, Twitter. Uh, on Twitter or in a, I don't know, in a council meeting or something, I don't know. Would you think that the police should spend time investigating or is it purely because this guy has influence? No, it's because 99% um, of racist comments do not go to the police, right? But when someone says you should shoot an MP in this country mm. after we've lost Joe Cox, mm. um, actually, we take and that David quite seriously. We take that, and yet, yes, we've lost two MPs because of people inciting violence to them. Mm. We do draw the line when public servants are threatened with being killed simply because of their mm. race. But we do say you shouldn't do that, and therefore there mm. is a sanction to that. And I that think we isn't... can all agree that uh, in, in this climate, or in any climate, even joking about MPs being killed is an awful thing to do. But, but is there not a double standard here? When Joe Brand joked about throwing battery acid in the face of Nigel Farage, People realised that she didn't physically actually want to do that. There wasn't a police investigation. There is an unfortunate phrase that many people use, oh, I, I would shoot them, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't actually mean that they're going to do that. Yeah, that that's... Are, we, are we not treating these two similar things in very, very different ways, Joe Brand and Frank Hester? No, look, there's plenty of comedians that have made racist jokes. There's people that pass, like... Bernard Manning and various other people, they're not arrested for them, right? That's not what happens. However, when people who are in senior positions in the way we manage our society and are funded through that make racist comments, then actually they're held accountable to, to, for that precisely because we support them more financially. That is true. Mm. That it, because we use large amounts of... I think there's a very strong argument for him to be made accountable. Him. But whether it needs to have police time, I think that's that's a more difficult question. The, the I think is, accountable in terms of uh, I don't know wh whether you in terms of the money perhaps being given back um, and that sort of thing and him being um, penalised. Very different from having the police investigate the first thing comments. To see, if somebody believes there's a crime being committed and that means it's reported to the police, the police investigate it. Hopefully, they'll investigate it swiftly. They are the people that are in charge of investigating criminal offences, together with the CPS. Yeah, if I think a lot of people would rather they focused on burglaries and sexual assault and robberies and fraud and everything else, rather than comments that were made quite a few years ago now. Look, the, the they... problem, I've got back to the question. If we want to protect MPs from being shot, right, or they're just their face in terms of we say you shouldn't do that or promote that, right? And actually, we will take action if you do that. Then there's a reason for him to be excused is simply because he gives £10 million to the Tory party. If somebody wore a helicopter um, on their jumper, on the back of their jumper, they would be arrested on the streets of Britain, and we would interpret that as behaving in a certain way. In fact, people have been. There have been 600 arrests based on our concern about what people are thinking. Well, supporting believe... terrorist organisations is slightly different. Well, to be honest, telling someone you're going to you want them shot is a terrorist act. We'd have to agree with that, right? I'm not sure, I'm not sure a reasonable person would interpret that figure of speech as a terrorist act. Well, look, I'm, I'm sorry. If you talk about going around shooting people because of their racial background... Um, I, well, my view is this. Did, the, did... Klu Klan, the Klu Klux Klan the um, British National Party and various organisations that terrorised black people mm. were terrorist organisations. Yes. Now, no people didn't accept that, 
at the time, but I do believe that to be the case. And in fact, OK, were... well, I think I think inciting terrorism, I think that maybe is a bit too far, but we're going to have to leave it there. But it's been really good to get your opinion on all mm. this. Uh, Wayman Bennett from Stand Up to Racism. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Um, I think uh... I think if, if a member of the Ku Klux Klan said something like that, you'd you'd absolutely think, well, number one, you'd hope that the Ku Klux Klan is prescribed. I mean, mm. it is an American group. I'm not sure what the British legal state sort of a position on it is. If it does exist in this country, I'd hope it's prescribed. Mm. But um, it, 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 people do say in language, oh, I want them shot. And, and, it, and it's not... Yeah, it's not always I think an incitement. Can, it's I a figure the, of speech. It's a bad figure yeah, of speech. And people shouldn't say it. The question is whether it's a hate crime it... because of the fact that, the, uh, that Diane Abbott's race and gender was used against her. But let us know what you think, gbviews.com. this guy said, say anything about anyone who wasn't Diane Abbott? Was it because she was black or was it because she was Diane Abbott? That's the question. Well, I mean, I think the comments, most people would agree that they were racist. Mm. So I think whether the police time is needed, that's a very different question in my opinion. But uh, let's return to the Nike shirt Nike. row now. And because Conservatives, Labour and Liberal Democrats have all united in criticising the decision, they've all had a go at this. Um, and this is, of course, to give the St George's Cross a bit of a playful update, or so they thought, on the New England football shirt. Yes, so the Labour Party leader, Sakir Starmer, told The Sun newspaper he thinks they should just reconsider and change it back. Previously, the shirts have regularly featured the classic, well, the only, the, the red and white cross of St George. Yes, in the last hour, though, here's your breaking news. In the last hour, Cabinet Minister Penny Mordaunt offered to collect complaints about Nike's new England kit and take them to the US company. But how does the British public feel? feel about all this. We've been in Birmingham and Nottingham speaking to you. Let's have a listen. I think, should change. I think it should be changed back. Um, you know, with the values that uh, that flag's built on, even from Scotland, you know, I appreciate England. I live down here. Uh, and I, I do want England to do well. Terrible. We we'll never buy it. Uh, the shirt itself is a rip-off price-wise. So why change it? I love it, actually, to be fair. I like the blue one. And I've got a black one out, or a dark one. I love it. Absolutely love it. Better than last season's one. I'm not entirely sure why they've changed it. The St George's Cross is the St George's Cross and doesn't need to be changed at all, really, does it? I'd call it more a desecration of the flag. I think it should stay as St George's Cross. It should be red and white. That's the England colours. I think it's silly. I mean, the flag is red and white, isn't it? Yeah, the flag's red and white, so it should stay red and white. I think it's just traditional, isn't it? Like, it's always been like that, so we shouldn't really change it. Uh, I don't understand why people at all should want to change any of our heritage. And, and want th th Those lads will be going out representing England. I think if you'd, if you'd put a different colour into the Irish shirt or the Scottish shirt or the Welsh shirt, all hell would have let loose, to be honest with you. I think it's a disgrace. Too much walk stuff. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, I loved listening to those views. They were fantastic, yeah. weren't they? Seems everyone there's a there's a consensus, isn't there? There is. That this was is. a silly thing. But also, to this do. is what GB News is about. Yeah. Getting not 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 just always talking to the politicians or the people in the media, but talking to real people out there in the real country and getting real views. That was Birmingham and Nottingham. Yeah, the so real there you country. go. Lots of people have an opinion. Everyone seems to have an opinion. I'd like to hear from our reporters who went out and got that, just whether <laughs> how, uh, how willing people were. Because sometimes yeah. you ask people a question out and about and they don't really have an opinion. They don't really mm. want to be asked. You know, they want you to go away, essentially. Sometimes when you ask people, they are desperate to have their mm. say. And I've got a feeling that this might be one of those things it's where everyone has an opinion. It's an Everyone has an opinion. Well, uh, we should say what Nike have said in their statement. Uh, the England's 2024 home kit disrupts history with a modern take on a classic. The trim of the cuffs takes its cues from the training gear worn by England's 1966 heroes, with a gradient of blues and reds topped with purple. The same colours also feature on an interpretation of the flag of St George on the back of the collar. This, it sounds to me like this was written by a chatbot. <laughs> it does. It um, sounds like know, chat GPT, please talk doesn't about, it? Talk about the, 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 uh, the new design. In a, in a flowery and poetic way, and then it writes it for you. Uh, we're not accusing Nike of using AI for their, um, for their press releases, but my goodness, they should probably make it seem like they do less. <laughs> anyway, coming up, we'll be speaking to the Member of Parliament for Milton Keynes South. As 63,000 houses, new builds, uh, they're being planned, or so they say. There's been uproar.
Speak Nation. Sunday nights from 7 p.m. I've got an idea. I think that all 30-year-olds should be given £10,000 from the banks of baby boomers. We've got a situation in this country now where millennials are the first generation in modern times expecting to be poorer than their parents. We, as 30-year-olds like me, are half as likely to own a house as people my age 30 years ago. In fact, the cost of a home in Britain compared to average incomes has as big a gap today as it did, wait for it, in the 1860s. It is a Dickensian situation. Now, I'm sorry about the housing crisis for your generation. You're not, though, are you? No, because you're I profiting am. from it. I'm profiting from it. Don't of course be ridiculous. You are. The house prices now, right. compared to that period. If this is the case, have, Benjamin. Have incomes gone up that fast? To, to penalise and punish the elderly when they have worked yeah. all their lives to put into the system and say it's your fault, whingy whiny, we're going to yeah, be envious. Um, but, but, no, Linda, no, we're no, being punished. No, well, by the politics, so be we're the change being punished you want to see in the world. Taxes, taxes, be the change. I am actually, and I'm about to tell you about the change I want to see in the world. Are you good? As long as you're not whining about it. I'm going to stop worrying about it, but the re we are being taken advantage of at the moment to profit, to help the old. Mo most of taxpayers' money is spent in two departments, the NHS, so the health department, and the Department for Work and Pensions. Those departments disproportionately serve the older population. Now, I've got no issue with that, but let's not pretend, let's not pretend that it is not young working people that is paying for the public services for old people. So actually, we are having it hard, and I just look at the future, and we see a future of perpetually higher taxes to pay for this increasing ageing population, a shrinking labour force, and you're here saying so we've got nothing to worry vote. about. The young stop voting for mass immigration parties, the young, I haven't. stop voting for Immigr parties Sorry, just to, just to point out, build houses. Immigrants actually pay taxes, pensioners don't. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Right, well, should our politicians be transparent about whether they've taken drugs? in the past and got up to no good. They are making policy mm. in that area. And this, of course, comes as Keir Starmer last night refused seven times to answer the question if he'd taken illegal drugs when he was younger. He said simply, I had fun at university. I can't believe he was asked seven times. I mean, and maybe he kept saying, four times. He, kept, okay. he sounded like Theresa May. He kept saying, I had fun at university. I had fun at university. At university, I had fun. I had fun at university. I just would Why was not he say so any other fun? <laughs> Why any was he other having so much fun? I would have thought he would have been, you know, in the library uh, till midnight, but perhaps he was a partier. Can't imagine it myself, but well, maybe he, he was. Well, he went to Leeds University, which does have a bit of a reputation for parties. But we don't know. We don't mm. know because he's denied any, any drug use, so we have well, no... no he hasn't. No, he hasn't denied it. He hasn't, that's the he point. Hasn't he hasn't denied confirmed it. or denied. He hasn't said he's, he's done it. He's been very loyally. Um, um, right. Very Gl annoying, yes. Shall we say, L um, Glenda, hello, has written in to say, I do want to know if politicians have taken or are taking drugs, because drugs, drugs can skew the brain, and it cannot be denied that our political masters are making some interesting decisions. <laughs> interesting take, Glenda. <laughs> Andy says, if the media has again... Hi, Andy. Andy writes in a lot. I like it when Andy writes in. He says, if the media has again started asking about politicians about drug habits, yawn, politics has truly been killed off by the blandness of the current political climate. 
Oh, Andy. Oh. Andy, what gets you going? Tell <laughs> us. <laughs> I, I would have thought that drugs is not particularly bland, but um, it did all kick off in that 2019 Tory leadership yeah. contest where you had the Michael Gove stuff, you had Rory Stewart's interesting escapades, Jeremy Hunt's cannabis lassie. Although David mm -hmm. Cameron perhaps had the best answer for this, which he, he wrote about in his autobiography after leaving politics, yeah. admitting that he what had he smoked say? cannabis. But while he was an MP, he said, I have not taken drugs while I've been in public life. OK, well, that's fine. And he fine. sort of had this demarcation before, you know, before he was elected to Parliament, it was almost a different world. Yeah. After he was elected to Parliament, he would answer every question. I'll keep your views coming in. Which is an interesting way to cut it. Yeah, David Cameron, a great uh, orator and a great interviewee. Oh, some, perhaps, some, some, might some, some might say he's probably the most prime ministerial in the Cabinet right now. Um, <laughs> Harsh. Keep your views coming in, gbviews at gbnews.com. But moving on, a hospital in Manchester is investigating allegations that its staff treated a nine-year-old child very differently because he was Jewish. Now, the uncle claims his nephew was made to lie on the floor and they think this is because he was wearing his kipper, so was visibly Jewish. But on a different occasion, when he wasn't visibly Jewish, he received very quick care. Well, meanwhile, the police are investigating a man for an arson attack that occurred yesterday on a house in Hackney. During his arrest, the man reportedly made comments that were deemed to be anti-Semitic. It all comes as an Israeli minister has labelled London as the most anti-Semitic city in the West. Not really what you want uh, to Not... be associated with our capital city, is it? Um, should we speak to David Rose, politics and investigations editor at the Jewish Chronicle? Now, I know, David, your publication has highlighted incidences of anti-Semitism in London and across the country, of course. Um, what do we know about this story? Um, have we had a word from the hospital or anyone that works there? We understand there is an investigation ongoing. It is... It is terrible to think that a boy visibly Jewish was treated so badly. Well, of course it is. I mean, he was nine years old. He suffers from a severe blood disorder that requires him to have uh, frequent blood transfusions. And he was undergoing one of these transfusions when, allegedly, uh, two nurses uh, wearing uh, badges that indicated that they supported the Palestinians uh, forced him out of the bed and took the cannula out, stopped the transfusion that he needed, you know, to enable him to, to live a normal life. Um, uh, and then on another occasion, as you say, um, apparently his treatment was quite normal when he wasn't wearing visible symbols of, of being Jewish. Um, so it is a matter of, of, of deep concern, but unfortunately, of course, it's uh, just one of very many incidents that have been reported since the October the 7th terrorist attacks. And all the evidence, uh, especially the figures gathered by the Community Security Trust, which is the Jewish community's defense and, uh, well, security organization that, that guards premises like synagogues and Jewish schools, suggests there has been a tremendous upsurge uh, with you know, the, the last few months of last year being by far the worst period on record for recorded anti-Semitic incidents. Well, David, uh, hold on. We're going to return to this conversation because it's time for our half-hourly bulletins, but we'll be back with you in just a couple moments' time. That's if David Rose, on the, line there. the uh, investigations editor at the Jewish Chronicle. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. 2.31 and uh, a look at the headlines this half hour. Rishi Sunak has criticised Nike's alteration of the St George's Cross on its New England football kit after changing the colours to blue and purple. The company says the redesign was a playful update ahead of the Euro 2024 tournament in June. Well, this afternoon, that kit was worn by England's under-21 side, who have secured a 5-1 win against Azerbaijan. However, speaking earlier, the Prime Minister said the traditional red and white colours are a mark of public pride and it shouldn't be messed with. Obviously, I prefer the original and my general view is that when it comes to our national flags, we shouldn't mess with them because they're a source of pride, identity, who we are, and they're perfect as they are. A man who's been described as a loner has been jailed for life for the murder of a couple he worked for by poisoning them with the opioid fentanyl. Luke DeWitt used a string of fake online personas to manipulate Carol and Stephen Baxter and later changed their will. The couple's daughter told Chelmsford Crown Court that the 34-year-old killer had completely brainwashed her mother by posing as a fake doctor. 
He was sentenced today and will serve a minimum of 37 years. The latest government figures show more than 800 people have illegally crossed the English Channel in small boats in the past week. 263 reached UK waters yesterday alone as criminal gangs took advantage of a brief weather improvement. That surge has prompted the government to declare a migrant emergency in the Channel and it takes the total number of crossings for the year so far to 4,300. That's up 600 on the same time last year. And the Prime Minister has refused to comment on a police investigation into alleged racist comments made by a Conservative donor. West Yorkshire police say they are now looking at whether a crime was committed by Frank Hester. It's reported he told a meeting in 2019 that the MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and said that she should be shot. And Nationwide has apologised to com customers after all payments in and out of accounts were delayed this morning. It says there was an issue impacting the faster payment system. But a spokesperson says the problem's now fixed and transactions are being processed. Those are the headlines. Plenty more to come throughout the afternoon. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Well, let's get straight back in with David Rose, policy, politics and investigations editor at the Jewish Chronicle. Now, David, when we left off, we were talking about the seeming pattern of rising incidents of hate against Jewish people in this country. Uh, is this a uniquely British problem? No, it's not a uniquely British problem. Uh, we're seeing the same sort of thing taking place in the United States. We're very much seeing it in France. There have been numerous appalling examples in France um, with um, anti-Semitic graffiti being dogged, Jews being attacked, uh, and so on. So it is not in any sense unique to Britain. Um, what is very disturbing, though, is that every time there is a conflict between Israel and uh, the terrorist organizations in the Middle East, mm. especially, of course, Hamas in Gaza, that you see this reflection outside Israel, uh, where Jews become targets come under attack in much greater numbers uh, when these conflicts take place. Now, obviously, this current conflict is by far the longest and worst uh, of any that have taken place really in Israel's history. And uh, therefore, I think it isn't any surprise to know that uh, or to learn that um, the number of incidents both in the UK and in other diaspora countries has been at an unprecedented level. I mean, in, in Britain, the Community Security Trust, the, the main Jewish defence organisation, recorded last year 4,103 incidents, uh, a, a figure much higher than any previous total, 147% increase since uh, 2022, but almost all of that increase taking place in that short period after October the 7th. Uh, David, um, just lastly, um, do you agree with the Israeli minister and his comments that uh, London is the most anti-Semitic, uh, well, city in, in uh, the no, West? Actually, do you I, agree I, with I, that? I, I, is that how Jewish no, people feel now? I think Jewish people um, feel um, a tremendous polarisation. Since October the 7th, uh, I have found, as a Jew, and many Jewish people who I know, feel that they have found a complete absence of any kind of understanding as to why the attacks of October the 7th were so traumatic, why they have left such a deep psychological impact, both on Jews outside Israel and inside Israel itself. But, um, you know, that contributes to the sense of maybe isolation and at times hostility. But I don't think it's true to say that London is, is uniquely bad at all. I think, you know, most British people uh, are, remain tolerant, inclusive and, you know, entirely, I mean, to say welcoming is ridiculous because the Jewish community has been established here in very large numbers for well over 100 years. Um, you know, I, I am a fourth generation immigrant. Um, so, and that, of course, is it, typical, and I'm not a young man. So, um, I, I think it's an exaggeration. I don't think it's helpful, quite frankly. I think it mm. is an international problem. But I also think that it was one of Hamas's main aims in launching this war. Hamas are, you know, a fanatical terrorist organization, but at the same time, they are rational. 
And I think it's very interesting to think, what did, what did Hamas want when it attacked on October the 7th? They must mm. have realized that after launching an attack, which led to such horrendous violence, to so yeah. many deaths and sexual violence and everything else, that mm. Israel would only respond in one way. Therefore, they, we must assume that they wanted that to happen. And I think one of the yeah. reasons they wanted it to happen was that they knew that it would lead to a huge upsurge in anti-Semitism, uh, not only in London, but in, in European and other cities across the world. And they're seeking to divide all of those communities. But David Rose, thank you very much for joining us and talking through this really, really serious issue. Yes, that's a very good point. I imagine mm. Hamas are very happy with Now, we should say that uh, we reached out for comment from this hospital we were talking about, and uh, we have a statement which uh, reads, we are aware of images and very serious claims which are circulating on social media. We are rapidly investigating these to establish the situation and uh, discussing them with the family involved. Royal Manchester Children's Hospital is committed to providing high-quality care to all our patients. Right, well, stick with us, because coming up, there has been outrage sparked in Milton Keynes, not just because of Tom's comments about how it's uh, laid out, but over plans to build 63,000 new homes. We'll be speaking to one of the MPs in Milton Keynes to get his view. Hi there and welcome to the forecast from the Met Office. It's going to feel cold in the wind for the rest of today in many places. Heavy showers and even some snow on the hills of northern UK. Low pressure now firmly in charge to the north of the country. Tightly packed isobars and our winds coming from the west, northwest, with this rain clearing for the rest of today from the southeast. Clear spells, yes, but also quite a number of showers coming in on that northwesterly wind. And those showers frequent and heavy across northwestern parts of the country. Not as many showers for the southeast, but for most places it's going to be a blustery night. And with those winds staying relatively brisk, it's going to be largely frost free as we start off Saturday, even if temperatures are close to freezing in many places. Now, we're going to start Saturday with those heavy showers getting going very quickly across many parts of the country. Some heavy downpours, even a rumble of thunder or two, some hail to lower levels, snow over the hills of Wales, northern England and Scotland. In the wind, it's going to feel particularly cold. 9 or 10 Celsius on the thermometer, feeling more like 4 to 6 degrees in the wind. Going into Sunday, less windy to start things, although still a brisk breeze down the North Sea coast. Some sunshine early on, still a few showers before further rain arrives later. That rain heralds an unsettled start to next week, and it stays cold. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. OK, well, let's return to the Nike shirt row because uh, all the parties are united in criticising the decision to give the uh, St George's Cross a playful update on the New England football shirt. Yes, well, let's discuss this story about the Nike shirt with Christopher Hope, who joins us live from Westminster. And, Christopher, it's rare to see an issue have such uh, uniformity of political response. 
Yeah, hi, Tom. Hi, Emily. Well, this really was an open goal for party leaders in a, the beginning of a local election campaign, a chance to have a go at a US company trying to reimagine our own St George's flag on the eve of England playing England-Brazil tomorrow and the England manager, Gareth Southgate, due to face the press tonight. There was simply no other way any could respond. We've seen, haven't we, from Lucy Fraser, the cultural secretary, saying the rainbow cross on the, on the shirts is pointless and unnecessary. Uh, Keir Starmer, it doesn't need to change. Even the Liberal Democrats, it seems a bit odd to change the colours of the national, nation's, nation's flag on a football shirt. We've heard also from Rishi Sunak. He's given remarks out. But, um, he, his remarks were slightly more lukewarm, I think, than, than maybe his um, other, other colleagues. Um, he said that uh, he prefers the original England shirt. Um, we asked um, <clears throat> number 10 earlier uh, today, would he boycott the shirt? Would he wear it for the Euros? Uh, there was no answer. Um, Penny Mordaunt, now she's the MP for Portsmouth. Um, some would say she wants to be Tory leader. Uh, she um, has sub subtweeted on the on the X uh, platform, Rishi Sunak, and said, "Damn right, I know how many times how many people have strong things on this. Sometimes it's hard to get your complaint heard by company like Nike. If you're from Portsmouth North, that's her seat. Email me, gives our email address, and I'll make sure your concerns are heard alongside mine." Ah, so, so Chris, it's only for constituents. Kind of... It's not for anyone around the country to get in touch with Penny. Only only her constituents. No, only. Yeah, and she, she is doubling or trebling down when the PM may just have simply made his concerns known. There's an election on, Tom and Emily. This is an easy hit for all three parties. In fact, I think Reform UK have got involved four parties with Lee Anderson. There's no, no doubt it's an easy hit on a Friday for any of these parties who want to show how much they care about the St George's flag. Yes, that's what it is, isn't it? An easy yeah. hit for them all to show how yeah. patriotic they are. I'm surprised at the Liberal Democrats. Usually they uh, go a bit funny on these sorts of things sometimes. You'd think they'd want it to be yellow and yeah. blue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yellow and blue, perhaps. Yeah. they do. It's so, so funny how they're all... I think Rishi Sunak should be a little less cautious. He could have really gone for this one. Yeah, but you don't want to no, necessarily um, yeah, get rebuffed by a company. Um, Chris, thank you so that's much true. for joining us and talking us through a remarkable, a remarkable unity of purpose there in politics today. <laughs> remarkable unity of purpose. Well, in just a moment, stay with us because we're going to be speaking to the MP for Milton Keynes South because there's lots of anger around over this plan to build 63,000 new homes in and around Milton Keynes. We'll find out what he has to make of it. Does he want these homes? This is GB News. Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday, they are fully packed today. But this is the issue. Here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal. Residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area. Here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say. What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other they've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say it's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancelled.
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. It's coming up to 10 minutes to three. And now, here's a story from a part of the world that has uh, sparked a lot of outrage. Yes, not in our backyard. Outrage in Milton Keynes over plans to build 63,000 new homes. Yes, the town in Buckingham... City. City. It's recently become the a city. city. Sorry, the city <laughs> in Buckinghamshire is a famous example of something that's called a planned city. So designed in the 1960s to alleviate housing congestion in London. But the new plans will see the city grow by more than half. And it seems as though quite a few residents and also local politicians aren't too pleased with all this. Um, so should we speak to Ian Stewart, who is a Conservative MP for Milton Keynes South? Ian, interested to get your views on this. Uh, the spotlight is very much on Milton Keynes. 63,000 homes does seem an enormous number. Is Milton Keynes ready? Well, I think you have to look at what, what has made Milton Keynes a success. Uh, you rightly say it was properly planned and designed back in the late 1960s. It was designed for a population of uh, approximately a quarter of a million uh, citizens. Now, we've reached that and we've gone beyond it. Uh, but we've worked. Uh, the, the, the Sunday time Times last weekend ranked us as one of the, the best places to live uh, in the country. But I'm really concerned that if we continue to grow too fast, too soon, and in an unplanned way that isn't supported by proper infrastructure, uh, that threatens some of the green spaces here in Milton Keynes and in the villages that surround it, we're going to undermine uh, the basis of that success. So I'm not a NIMBY. Yes, we need to look at uh, how we develop over the years, but I'm really concerned that this figure is far too much uh, and, as I say, will undermine some of the successes we've had. We've reached out to the council today, Ian, and they seem fairly upset that this number, 63,000, keeps being banded about. Uh, they say that actually some of this number's already been built and the rest isn't until 2050, that it is going to be methodical and planned uh, and, and, and grown in the way that you would like. But we've not seen any evidence of that. Uh, we're already meeting the, the requirements we have to plan for new housing in the future. Uh, I, I see it from where I live in Milton Keynes. There are new places going up all the time. We're more than meeting the, the five-year uh, uh, target that, that is required. Uh, but it's, just, it's, it's about the scale of this. It's too much too soon without us seeing any detail of, of how this is going to work, how our green space is going to be protected. It's the quality of life that I'm concerned about. Uh, and, you know, it's very easy just to say we're going to bump new housing estates around the peripheries of Mills and Keynes uh, without giving uh, proper thought to the, the transport links, to the public services uh, that we all want to see. Uh, so, yes. You know, How we're is not Milton Keynes Keynes when it comes to that? Can people get already? Can they already find a dentist easily? Are there enough schools? Are there enough transport, buses, etc., etc.? Because this, of course, is the worry. Some people have been writing in who uh, live in the villages or know people who live in the villages, and that's the concern, that they're just simply, you know, they don't want those homes there because there's not enough enough infrastructure. So is there? How is it in Milton Keynes? We are planning for the future. Um, Milton Keynes Hospital, for example, is one of the government's uh, 40 new hospitals, a new woman and maternity hospital, uh, which is being designed for 2030 and beyond, so to meet that demand. But that's on the basis of existing population. Uh, 
uh, not you know doubling the rate uh, of new houses. So you know these are the things that you have to think about. You know I, I'm great champion of the East West Railway Line, which mm. is going to improve the connectivity from Bletchley and Milton Keynes Central uh, to Oxford and other destinations. That's all good. That's happening. But you can't just sort of sit, suddenly say we're going to have all these extra houses without properly planning the but, infrastructure. But, but Ian, if we're looking across the country, we know that we've not been hitting our housing targets for years and years and years, for decades even. Isn't yes. Milton Keynes perhaps the perfect place to have a lot of these new houses? You spoke about the new railway line. You spoke about the new hospital. There is new infrastructure here. Surely this Milton Keynes perhaps should be pulling more than its own weight compared to some other parts of the country that don't have new infrastructure like Milton Keynes? Well, as I say, we're, we're continuing to grow. It's not as if we're saying, you know, put up the stop signs, but no more houses anywhere. We're, we're already doing that. But it's the alignment of that into, mm. you know, proper planning, uh, mm. making sure that the houses are affordable. If you look at the average cost of a new build in Milton Keynes, it's about 475000 Mm, that wow. is way above what many local people. And I've got so uh, we're running to the end, but I just do have to get a comment from you on this England shirt design. Do you think that uh, it should be its its classic red and white? Well, I have to say, as a Scotsman who, who represents uh, Milton Keynes, I'm perhaps not the best person to answer that. <laughs> but, you know, we, we have our national colours. Let's stick with that. We don't need to go down this route at all. So but I don't know whether they you know, like deliberately did this to for increase their, their marketing. But, no, we've got our national colours. Let's stick with them. OK, well, um, thank you very much indeed, Ian Stewart, the Conservative MP for yes. Milton Keynes. South. Absolutely. A, a, a proud Scotsman, but representing an English constituency, an interesting Funny how uh, that happens, mel isn't it? meld of all, the, of all the best of the United Kingdom. Well, it's been a fantastic show, fantastic week. Thank you for joining us. Martin Dobney is up next. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there and welcome to the forecast from the Met Office. It's going to feel cold in the wind for the rest of today in many places. Heavy showers and even some snow on the hills of northern UK. Low pressure now firmly in charge to the north of the country. Tightly packed ice of us and our winds coming from the west northwest with this rain clearing for the rest of today from the southeast. Clear spells, yes, but also quite a number of showers coming in on that northwesterly wind. And those showers frequent and heavy across northwestern parts of the country. Not as many showers for the southeast, but for most places it's going to be a blustery night. And with those winds staying relatively brisk, it's going to be largely frost free as we start off Saturday, even if temperatures are close to freezing in many places. Now, we're going to start Saturday with those heavy showers getting going very quickly across many parts of the country. Some heavy downpours, even a rumble of thunder or two, some hail to lower levels, snow over the hills of Wales, northern England and Scotland. In the wind, it's going to feel particularly cold. 9 or 10 Celsius on the thermometer, feeling more like 4 to 6 degrees in the wind. Going into Sunday, less windy to start things, although still a brisk breeze down the North Sea coast. Some sunshine early on, still a few showers before further rain arrives later. That rain heralds an unsettled start to next week and it stays cold. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 
£145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, 